Okay, I would like to welcome all of you to this uh, special presentation on the deep national security state and UFOs. And uh, this is going to be a presentation uh, four hours in length. We will take a break at about um, the halfway point, maybe about an hour and 45 minutes in, two hours. And I'd like to just thank all of you for coming. I know you've been from all over the, the country here, people here from Chicago, New York, all over, and I want to appreciate, uh, express my appreciation for your support and effort in, in coming all that way to be here. Um, I'd also like to welcome all the folks online. There are several thousand people uh, online who will be seeing this by webinar, and I'd like to uh, extend a, a welcome to them and a big shout out to them for coming. Thank you, you're here in virtual reality, huh? Yeah, why not? So I'm Dr. Stephen Greer, and um, the founder of the Disclosure Project and the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence and the Orion Project. Those are all now sort of amalgamated under uh, SeriousDisclosure.com if you want to go and see what all the projects are doing at any time. And um, we're uh, going to be doing this presentation, which is going to be part of a series. Uh, and. Uh, I really want to thank the people who've supported me all these years in getting this far. There's some folks who are volunteers out front who've been on many expeditions with me out under the stars uh, and people all over the world. Uh, my mentors in the national security state who, without them, I would have never had a Sherpa to figure out how this whole system works. Uh, you're going to learn things tonight, today, that the President of the United States doesn't know. I will assure you of that. I'll give you my assurance that it's true. Um, it is also true that without some very special person, and her name is Emily, and my wife of 36 years, we wouldn't be here. So a big thank you to Emily. She set this up. And really and truly, if, if Emily had not supported me all these years, there aren't many um, uh, Jewish doctors, daughters, wives, who will be happy with their husband leaving a career in emergency medicine to be doing this for virtually nothing for 25 years. And that's when we started this project 25 years ago. So uh, she's an amazing person, and without her, uh, we would have never, ever gotten this far. She's really been the indispensable person that nobody knows about, and I want to acknowledge her. So thank you, Emily, love you. Um, so the other thing I'd like to do is we just some housekeeping things. Uh, again, no cell phones, please. And um, if there are any children who are uh, on the webinar, uh, I know this sounds strange. We're going to go through some things that are disturbing. And I would say parental discretion is advised for that reason. I usually would not say that, but we are today, and I need to say it. And the first thing I want to go through is sort of a, an architecture of what the deep national security state is. Because this is something that when I started out in 1990, I didn't think could possibly be true. And in fact, when I was meeting with the French government officials a few years ago here in Washington and then out at our farm in Virginia, um, I got a uh, phone call from an Air Force intelligence guy and a liaison to the French president at that time, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy who said, this is fantastic and terrible. And he didn't know if he quite believed it. And I said, well, come to Washington and I'll let you meet with some folks um, who are in the deep, deep national security state who will confirm everything I'm about to tell you. So they came to Washington and we had a meeting and I began to explain to them that there are two governments. There's the government of we the people at Thomas Jefferson spoke of that we have elected and uh, those who have been appointed. And since World War II, there has evolved uh, a monster, which you're going to hear about, which desperately needs to be put on a leash and eventually phased out. And that is the deep national security state of unacknowledged special access projects. Now, this is a term most people are not familiar with. Almost, most of you, if you're anyone here from DC, raise your hand if you're a DC person. You probably have heard of TSSCI, Top Secret Special Compartmented Intelligence. Um, a top secret clearance are like 985,000 people who have them. It's 
you know, that and $1.50 will get you on the metro. So those are not unusual. What's unusual are the projects I'm about to talk to you about. And these unacknowledged special access projects are projects that have not been supervised by the president or the Congress in an appropriate way since 1956, at least 1956. And this is a key date for you to keep in mind. Um, I was one year old, so I couldn't do anything about that. Most of us here weren't of an age where we could have done anything about that disaster. But we're going to talk about how that evolved and, and how an unacknowledged special access project really operates. The very first thing you need to understand is that it developed as a consequence of the extraordinary secrecy around the UFO issue. And if you doubt it, it goes all the way back to 1945. And I'm going to go through some documents. The one that's up here is one that we acquired and released. It's now the number one viewed document on the FBI site, this one. But before I get to that, I want to talk about what happened in the 1940s, in World War II. So most of you know we had President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and there were events going on in Europe and also in the Pacific, but mainly in Europe, um, where there were these things called Foo Fighters. Yes, it's a rock group, and uh, Dave Grohl, it's a great guy, he named his band after what I'm about to tell you. But a Foo Fighter, aside from being a, a really fun rock band, um, were objects that were flying around our aircraft in World War II. Sometimes they were fully materialized, hard. Most of the time, they were an energy field that looked spherical. And they could come through an aircraft, even coming down the center of an aircraft and out the other end. This is the trans-dimensional nature of extraterrestrial technologies that I covered in a previous workshop. This became a huge concern for the Allies. And the Allies uh, dispatched, or the President, I should say, on behalf of the Allies, dispatched a man named General Jimmy Doolittle. Now, how do I knew this? Because his nephew is a dear friend of mine, Dr. John Altshuler. Dr. Altshuler was a hematologist, oncologist in Denver, very renowned. And he was asked, uh, General Doolittle was asked to go over to the theater of operations in, in uh, Europe to find out what the hell these things were. Now, the word Foo Fighters come from sort of French and German faux for fire, because they were these fiery, had a luminous corona around them. And, uh, but they, were, they would disrupt electromagnetic signals. Uh, they would have effects on the gravity around an aircraft uh, and other things such as uh, guidance systems, compasses, and what have you. And so we thought, the Americans and British thought, it was a secret Nazi weapon. And we found out through our spies that the Germans thought it was a secret allied weapon. And of course, it was neither. So General Doolittle went over and investigated this and came back to the White House and reported back to President Roosevelt and said, sir, these are interplanetary vehicles, I'm quoting. And so began the modern era of a serious concern uh, from the national security level about UFOs. You can argue it went back to the airship scare of 1890s, late 1890s, where there were massive crafts seen off the coast of California, but there wasn't that much official concern at that point. It was sort of an enigma. But in World War II, because of the type of weapons being developed, both by Hitler and by America, the interstellars, as I call them, became very concerned about what humans were doing on Earth and the risk of us destroying this planet, uh, which I believe, I mean, carefully in analyzing the history of this, that they have a interest in its survival and humanity's survival. And so the president at that point did assemble a group of folks uh, that included Oppenheimer, uh, people who worked on the Manhattan Project, uh, Dr. 
uh, Vannevar Bush, uh, no relationship to President Bush, um, and others to look into the issue. Uh, by the time we detonated the first atomic bomb, uh, the facilities at White Sands uh, Missile Range in New Mexico um, and Alamogordo, that area, were being overflown regularly by UFOs. And they were very concerned, obviously, that we were developing weapons that could terminate life on the planet. And they could see where this was headed. So this was not something that just happened out of the blue. There's a history here you must understand. In the early days, and I'm talking now from the early mid-1940s until 1956, there was a reasonable level of constitutional oversight by key members of Congress, senior people in the administrations, and the President of the United States. Everything changed in 1956. Now, when we had the only nuclear, and actually technically it's an atomic bomb squadron and not a thermonuclear one that was developed later. Everybody know the difference between atomic and thermonuclear? Atomic bomb is fission, nuclear is fusion, hydrogen. Anyway, the atomic bomb that we dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki was developed, as you all know, in New Mexico and was tested at White Sands and eventually in Roswell, New Mexico, that was the only bomber squadron that had atomic bombs in the world for a number of years before the Soviet Union developed them. And in, in 1947, there were two or three, I have intelligence recently that indicates there were three uh, so-called flying saucers, disks, flying by and doing surveillance of the 509th Bomber Squadron, which was the only atomic bomb squadron in the world. And they switched on, suddenly, a, an alleged radar system. Read this document carefully. Now, this, I know it's hard for you to see the original. It's dated 1950. It was to J. Edgar Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover buildings right near here. And an Air Force a source stated that there were uh, three flying saucers recovered in New Mexico. Um, they're described as circular in shape with raised centers, 50 feet in diameter. Each one was occupied by three bodies of human shape, but only three feet tall. They're actually about 39 inches tall. Um, in metallic cloth, very fine texture, et cetera. And it says that the saucers were found in New Mexico due to the fact that the government has a very high-powered radar set up in that area, and it's believed the radar interferes with the controlling mechanism of the saucers. This is a little bit anthropocentric and childish because if you can go interstellar, you can handle a radar system. What actually happened is that those radar domes had a scalar longitudinal electromagnetic weapon, which is another whole classification of electromagnetic warfare systems that we'll get into later. But suffice it to say, it was an early scalar Star Wars hit. And when they switched that on, at least two of these disks collided. One went down uh, northwest of Roswell. The other one continued and was more intact and was impacted near Socorro, New Mexico. And that's where they actually retrieved the bodies. The ones that was just north of um, Roswell was obliterated into little teeny pieces, tiny little pieces. Where they did retrieve, and we have disclosure project witnesses who have testified to this, where they, who have personally seen what looks like almost hieroglyphic writing on some of the little parts that were retrieved. And I know I've, I've seen these, and it's, it's very interesting because it's reminiscent of the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, but not this, quite the same. But you wonder where the pyramids came from. So that event was an early hit. Now there are some reports of others, but that's the most documented one. This document from the FBI is significant because obviously three years later, 
you had one branch of the government trying to find out what the other top secret branch of the government was doing. You can tell by the tone of it. I made inquiries through here and there. So it's a bunch of skullduggery that happens between agencies and competition. And there's always been competition between FBI, CIA, Air Force Intelligence, et cetera, and so on. And this happens not just with the United States, it also happens within, between allies and, and alliances. For example, the next document, if you can pull this up, this is one of the most important documents. And by the way, after I briefed the CIA director about all this stuff, the sitting CIA director for President Clinton, which we'll get into in a moment, um, I got a cache of several thousand of these documents, about 5,000 of them. Um, and they're in my vault. I don't know what to do with them. Um, if we presented what was in them, it would take us from now until 2017. But let me just say that this document was accidentally released by the Canadian government, and if you look at the date on it, 1950, November 21st, how ironic. This is the 65th anniversary of the writing of this document by Wilbur Smith, who had a top secret clearance, and he was tasked by the Canadian government to find out what the Americans were doing. And if you look at page two, if you go down to page two of this, you're gonna see a, just a brief summary, which I think is, there's a whole lot of detail in the document. This is on our website now, you can look it up. Many of you may have seen this one already, but I want to, the reason I want to present it is the importance of the document. And, he's, and it says, the matter is the most highly classified subject in the United States government, rating higher than the H-bomb. Think about that. The H-bomb wasn't detonated until 1952. It was the ultimate doomsday weapon. This project dealing with UFOs and interstellar technologies was more highly classified than the H-bomb, period. B, flying saucers exist, period. Their modus operandi is unknown, but a concentrated effort is being made by a small group of headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush, who also worked with Edward Teller, Oppenheimer, and others. And four, the entire matter is considered by the United States authorities to be of tremendous significance. I have a whole dossier that a Canadian put together of the Wilbur Smith investigations on behalf of the Canadian government to find out what in the hell the Americans were doing with these extraterrestrial vehicles. It's a fascinating case. Now, the reason this is so important is that it acknowledges two, several things, that they exist, that it's the most secret issue in the US government, exceeding the secrecy of the H-bomb, and that a group had been put together to study how they operate. Well, they were studying materiel recovered from one or more interstellar crashes that were the result of using the scalar longitudinal electromagnetic systems, which Tesla had worked on and others had worked on in the early part of the 20th century. Um, keep in mind that by the early 1900s, there had been experiments done on not only scalar and electromagnetics, that uh, uh, longitudinal systems, which are just to put it in a simple layman's term, the light in this room that we're looking at it has a wave function and a particle function. It goes 186,000 miles a second. A scalar longitudinal system is there's no wave. It's boom, and it's a point, and it's multiples of the speed of light. And so once you understand how these operate, and I have folks at the Naval Research Labs here in Washington who have done communication systems developed based on pulsed scalar systems that are multiple of the speed of light. So if you think that you cannot communicate faster than the speed of light, you are wrong. And the physicists are wrong. It's because they don't know about the scalar end of this, but that's a no, because that's all classified. They're not going to teach you that at MIT or Caltech. So these systems have been developed uh, and have been deployed since at least the mid-1940s, which is a frightening thought because it's an area of technology that is potentially devastating uh, 
if it's in the wrong hands. And unfortunately, it fell into the wrong hands, and there it remains. So one of the things that happened uh, along the lines around this time, the next document, a very important one, look at the release date. It was a few, it was a little bit, a little while after, a few months after I briefed the CIA director. So after I met with him, I said, look, I'm gonna give you a, a list of stuff I wanna see if I can get. I got this massive box, <laughs> came out to my farm in Virginia. And this is one of them, and there are others. Um, and it's fr from 1953, although you can't see the date on it very well here. Uh, and it's, it's uh, about the, uh, the, the <laughs> It's written by the director of the CIA to the director of Psychological Strategy Board. Psychological Strategy Board. What? Psychological Warfare. And it says, you can read it, uh, I'm transmitting to the National Security Council a proposal, tab B, A, which we don't have, which is concluded that the problems connected to UFOs appear to have implications for psychological warfare as well as for intelligence and operations. And then there's another tab, B, which has the background. I'd love to see that one. I suggest that we discuss in an early board meeting the possible offensive or defensive utilization of these phenomena for psychological warfare purposes. Remember this document four hours from now because basically what they concluded was they needed to do a few things. They wanted to be able to set up a deception around the subject and put out false information, use it as a cover story for classified aerospace research. So oftentimes there will be something that happens and it will look like a UFO and it's actually a Northrop Grumman, my uncle's company was Northrop Grumman, he worked on the thing that landed on the moon, the lunar module or the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works or some other aerospace entity, and it will be 100% man-made, and the public will say, oh my God, it's a UFO. And they'll not correct them. There's no correction forthcoming. They want you to believe it's a UFO. Why? Because it provides a cover for classified research with technologies that, if they were allowed to come out, would terminate the oil and gas and coal industry. They're using zero-point energy and gravity control. Which then brings me to the next issue, and, uh, and that is by 1954, October, so now we're 61 years plus one month, into an era, and this was confirmed to me by the third highest ranking official at the Naval Research Labs and the highest ranking scientist, in other words, someone who not, wasn't a bureaucrat, at the Naval Research Labs, which Thomas Edison founded, and the Naval Research Labs is the largest defense lab in the United States. And Richard Foch, uh, and I knew him for many years before he passed away of prostate cancer not too long ago, was uh, this gentleman, I've never wanted to discuss who he was until he passed away. And he was a very senior guy in this system. And uh, one of the things that he shared is that he was in the vault, the same vault that the next document came out of, which has a great story behind it. And he was going through some documentation and found that it wasn't in the 50s that we really started, I mean, the, 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 the 60s or 70s, but it was in the 50s that we actually mastered gravity control. Now, what does that mean? Gravity control is the ability to put an electromagnetic field at certain voltages and with certain angular momentum. I don't want to get into a lot of, put you to sleep, I got into the physics of it too far, so that this object becomes massless, weightless, no mass, M-A-S-S. -S. So, the mass component, and this has to do with angular momentum and things of this sort of the subatomic particles, can make this object so light that it has no mass, which means if you look at your physics equations, 
mass, velocity is inversely proportional to mass. Go look it up. So if mass becomes zero, velocity can go to infinity in, in a given amount of energy, which means you can move into another dimension. It doesn't go to infinity, you go, in, you go trans-dimensional. We'll talk about this some more later. And this began to be experimented with uh, in the 1920s. A guy named T. Townsend Brown developed a system using crystalline structures and very high voltages going into an object so that and an object would begin to levitate. Marcel Vogel, the chief, one of the chief engineer scientists for IBM in North Carolina on the Reynolds estate, did the same thing in the 60s and 70s. One of the members of my team and uh, one of our disclosure project witnesses um, worked with Marcel Vogel doing this with crystalline structures. And it can be crystals, but it can also be nanocrystalline materials such as metallic. So as you know, all most metals and rocks are crystal. Actually, water is crystalline. We're crystalline. So you can put this system around almost anything, and it will begin to become increasingly massless. Now, it doesn't have to be zero mass. Maybe it's 0.1 mass. So it's still materialized, and you see it. But it means, man, can you accelerate this thing? So it means you can, instead of going like the space shuttle at 25,000 miles an hour, you can go at several million miles per hour and take a right turn. And there's no deceleration effect because everyone on board is corrected for 1G. So this is what they began, 1G gravitational force. So this is what began to develop in the 20s, got taken into some Air, uh, Army Air Force projects in the 30s and 40s, and was Adolf Hitler's secret weapon. Adolf Hitler, they weren't making the, the, the progress on the atomic bomb that we were, but they had almost perfected gravity control by the time World War II ended. Now, one of the things that the OSS did, the Office of uh, the Special Services, um, which became the CIA after World War II, they had a, something, you can look this up, called Operation Paperclip. And Operation Paperclip, a whole book was written on it not too long ago, about how they would put a paperclip on the file of the Nazis that we didn't want to go to Nuremberg and execute, but that whose knowledge was so great that we wanted them as part of our program. We wanted what they knew. So one of these guys is a guy named Werner von Braun, who, of course, invented the rocket, the V2 rocket for Adolf Hitler. Um, Hermann Oberth. These were all the, the giants of rocketry and aerospace for Adolf Hitler. They became the foundation of, brought in by the CIA, what became the CIA, of our space program in the 1940s and 50s, which is how we leapt ahead of the Soviet Union, because we took all those people first ahead of the, so, of, of, of the Soviet Union. Interesting bit of history. You don't read this many places. Um, but most, a lot of what I'm telling you is in conventional history books, not the UFO part. That's been sanitized out. That's forbidden knowledge. So as a result, by the time we had those guys and the experimentation that had been done with, by T. Townsend Brown, whose work became a part of a corporation called the RAND Corporation, which still exists, a huge think tank, um, we really had something going. You add to this the study of materiel and electronics retrieved from interstellar vehicles that were shot down. So a lot of people say, oh, well, the things we have, are they all just reverse engineered from interstellar ET? I said, no. The laws of the universe are universal, and the mind of man, just like the man of an ET, can unravel the mysteries of the universe. And so it has come to pass. But if you take, we're not starting at zero when we retrieve the objects that were interstellar. We were starting with decades of research in classified electronics, electromagnetic fields, anti-gravity, scalar systems, et cetera, and so on, that had been going on since the time of Nikola Tesla the true genius of the 20th century, not Albert Einstein, by the way, so, um, who is a minor luminary compared to Tesla. And 
Sorry, Einstein fans, it's true. Uh, by the way, that's why when Nikola Tesla died, the FBI swooped into his apartment and confiscated all of his secret papers. And how do I know this? I have a document from the Department of Defense demanding that the FBI turn them over and names them for what they are, the secret papers of Nikola Tesla. This is not an urban myth. I have that document. It came in this cache of documents I'm talking about. So when you have all of that knowledge, it's then augmented, increased, uh, potentiated by the study of, as the Wilbur Smith document says, the materiel that was interstellar. Because you need specialized materials. You need um, control systems. You need integrated circuits, which we did not have in the 40s, which came from this. You need fiber optics. You need all kinds of stuff. So some of the technologies, and this is where uh, Colonel Corso, who worked on these projects tangentially, is correct. If you read The Day After Roswell, he says fiber optics, integrated circuits, and a whole slew of things came from studying the materiel from these crashed ET interstellar objects. So you had the biggest and most top secret most well-funded project in the history of the United States going on, nobody knew about it. It's completely sub rosa. It was more secret than the hydrogen bomb. And so between 1945 and 1954, the brain power of those Nazi aerospace folks like Werner von Braun and Herbert Ober, the work of T. Townsend Brown and others, Edward Teller, some of the brightest and most ingenious people in the world, put, bent their attention primarily not to the hydrogen bomb, but to gravity control. And what, how are these interstellar visitors getting here? Because that would then be the ultimate edge, wouldn't it? In the technological arms race. You talk about a delivery system. You don't need an intercontinental ballistic missile that goes a few thousand miles an hour if you can deliver something instantly from one continent to another, or worse, from one planet to another. You begin to see the implications of this for national security. Therefore, it was managed in an extraordinary fashion, and the secrecy around it was increasingly ruthless, so much so that by 19... 56, the President of the United States, a man named Dwight Eisenhower, most of us drive on Eisenhower era highways using 1880s Mercedes type internal combustion engine cars that are run by fossil fuels, all of which have been obsolete since the 1940s or sooner. But Eisenhower was a five star general, became president, two term president and um, was a Republican, very patriotic, um, but also very naively trusting. Jackie Gleason, the very famous comedian, uh, his wife, uh, were friends with some folks that, that had been on my team before they passed away, and said that uh, Eisenhower on his deathbed was a very bitter man over what happened to him between 1954 and when he left office in early 1961 when Jack Kennedy became the President of the United States. And in 1956, a man named Nelson Rockefeller, who later, of course, became Vice President, and prior to that was an operative in the military-industrial complex and the emerging deep national security state, uh, Nelson headed up what's called the Rockefeller Commission, and the Rockefeller Commission in 1956 reorganized the Pentagon, Department of Defense, CIA, the whole alphabet soup of secret entities. And they did so in such a way that it became labyrinthine, Byzantine, almost impossible to penetrate by anyone who wanted to navigate through it. 
Um, in the early days, there was still some presidential knowledge. We have one of our witnesses, uh, Mr. Lovkin, who is an attorney, who was a young man, White House Signal Corps here at the White House down the street from where we're speaking today. Um, you can look at his testimony on our website, seriousdisclosure.com, and he said, yes, he would be at meetings and the, the, he, the, the Eisenhower would be making doodles, pictures of, of UFOs and ET crap. In fact, I have one sitting in my uh, condo here in D.C. that someone lifted from the archives. I won't say where and how. And um, he said basically Eisenhower was voiced to him with great frustration over the fact that there were all these projects going on and he had lost control of the oversight of them. So what happened with the Rockefeller Commission in 1956 is that they made it virtually impossible for any ordinary congressman or president, because you know they come every four to eight years, don't they? So by the time they leave, even if they're there eight years, maybe they're a little less wet behind the ears. But it, it's a system that guarantees their ignorance, except to the extent that they want to give you just enough information to control what's going on. We'll get into this in a moment. So by the time Eisenhower left office, he made the very famous speech about beware of the military industrial complex, as you've seen in the film Sirius. By the way, Sirius became number one on Netflix a few months ago. Cool, thank you guys for supporting that. And the president said it will become a threat to our national security and our way of life. Not the UFOs, the secrecy, no less a figure the same year, Admiral Roscoe Hillenkeeter, who was the first director of the CIA, go look this document up. I mean, I have more documents than we have time for me to go through. And it's a letter where he's writing and saying that the secrecy around the UFO subject is a threat to our national security and to the United States. This is the first CIA director, because he also later found out he was being Schmidt canned pushed aside by these neo-fascists who had taken over the intelligence community, the aerospace community, and the large corporations. What happened over those years from 1947 until 1956 was that there was a deliberate, albeit imperceptible initially, takeover by the corporate state. Corporations working with unacknowledged special access projects, which are completely off the radar, not funded officially, took over operations. And as a result of that, those national security programs increasingly became out of reach for the president, out of reach for members of Congress, or even cabinet level people like CIA directors and secretaries of state and secretaries of state and people of this sort. So this was a gradual thing that happened, but there was a, an abrupt change by 56. By 1961, when Eisenhower left office, frankly, we were done. It was done. Now, you know, I couldn't do anything about that at that point. Couldn't run the disclosure project because I was only five years old or six. And so it just suffered and went along. And the, and the national security apparatus got bigger and bigger and bigger. When Jack Kennedy took over in January of 1961, uh, he had a great interest in this. And he was, in fact, briefed on the subject. But as we know from a Lieutenant Halt, who was on uh, the early uh, meetings I had uh, that ironically Nelson's brother Lawrence Rockefeller, who is the white hat in the Rockefeller clan who actually wanted to end secrecy on the subject. Lawrence Rockefeller was a very early supporter of CSETI and the Disclosure Project. And he funded and I organized the Asilomar Monterey gathering of KGB, CIA, astronauts, cosmonauts uh, in 1995. And what I found is that some of the people who came uh, had been involved with the Kennedy administration. And one of these gentlemen, this lieutenant colonel, was on Air Force One flying to uh, Berlin 
when uh, Kennedy made that very famous speech, I am a Berliner, although I think he misspoke it a little, but um, from what I hear from the Germans. Uh, but on that flight, this uh, Air Force officer, who was sort of like the chief steward who sort of ran uh, Air Force One for the president, had a chat. And this issue came up because he had had, he, he had been a pilot who had seen one of these uh, UFOs when, as, a, as an Air Force pilot. And there are thousands of sightings like this that we have in our archive. And he brought this up to the president. He says, oh, yes, I know about this. He says, I've been briefed on it a little bit. But, and now I'm quoting, I have this audio tape. It is chilling, the audio tape. But he says, unfortunately, the whole matter, this is the president speaking, the whole matter is out of my hands, and I don't know why and began to cry. So we know, and that was 1963, June of 63, and of course he was killed in November. Um, but before that, some other tragic things happened. There are a lot of tragedies here, um, the main thing being the loss of almost a century of evolution by the, the human race, which is why I left medicine. I always tell people, I used to say try to save a life one at a time. Now we have to do something to save the entire human race and planet from what is a disastrous situation that's developed. So I just say that now all of us have to work together because our patient is Gaia, the Earth, and her seven billion children. But if you look at this document, the next one, this is a very dangerous document to have. <laughs> I'm gonna have to give you the provenance of this. This is the Marilyn Monroe document. It's basically a death warrant for poor Marilyn Monroe. And you look at the date on it, 3 August 1962. They found her dead the 5th of August. It's signed by James Jesus Angleton III at the bottom. Project Moondust up at the top and Project 46. These are correct code names and code numbers for UFO ET related projects uh, by the agency as of that date. And as you read through it, and uh, it gives some background, it's a wiretap summary if you look at the, the top of it. Uh, it's, I know it's a very degraded document, but it's a wiretap summary of telephone conversations between Marilyn Monroe and Robert Kennedy, the Attorney General, and a guy named Rothberg, who was a art dealer in New York. And they were tapping Marilyn's phone because she had had tryst, as it says here, with the President. And everyone knows now she had an affair with both Jack Kennedy and Robert Kennedy. And in Pillow Talk, the President had told her some things. And it says one such secret that she was going to divulge in a news conference mentions the visit by the president at a secret air base for the purpose of inspecting things from outer space. I don't think they're talking about uh, meteorites. Kilgallen, who had been a reporter who dug into this, replied that she knew what might be the source of the visit. In the mid-50s, Kilgallen learned of a secret effort by US and UK governments to identify the origins of crashed spacecraft and dead bodies from a British government official. That was Lord Mountbatten. Kilgallen believed the story, who was later blown up by an IRA bomb, or so it was made to appear. Kilgallen believed the story may have come from the New Mexico crash in the late 40s, clear reference to the Roswell event. And he, she said that if the story is true, it would cause terrible embarrassment to Jack and his plans to have NASA put men on the moon, because we were using old rockets from the 40s when the secret organization already had anti-gravity under control. Um, the subject repeatedly called the Attorney General and complained about the way she was being ignored by the President. The subject threatened to hold a press conference and would tell all, underline in the original document. That's not my underlining. Uh, the subject made references to bases in Cuba, Cuba and knew of the President's plan to kill Castro. And uh, number five, the subject made references to her diary of secrets and what the newspapers would do with such disclosures. Two days later, she's found dead. Now, um, this document, how did I get it? <laughs> it's top secret, and it has not been declassified, and it is authentic. Uh, a man whose family helped found the National Security Agency, NSA, 
who was so supportive of what the work I was doing that he appeared one day with this document. And it's, it was a huge, one of those old Xerox from a big, uh, you know, government Xerox machine. My, the original I have in my vault is quite impressive. And he says, you need to know the kinds of things. I think he was not trying to scare me off, but he was wanting me to know the kinds of things that have been done to people who tell these kind of secrets. And so he gave me this document. And uh, as soon as I saw it, I, I suspected it was legitimate. Later, I had it inspected by a man who I don't wish to name, but he was the um, officer who was uh, General Odom, O-D-O-M, who was head of the NSA for years. He was General Odom's right-hand guy, literally carried his briefcase. And he became a document authenticator and a lecturer at University of Maryland who, uh, frankly, when he looked at it, he says, without me taking it from the vault myself, I can tell you 95% certainty it's authentic. Because everything in it. So basically what happened is that Marilyn Monroe was being jilted by the Kennedys because it was becoming too well known they were having an affair. The Kennedys did not order her assassination. Angleton did. Now who is Angleton? Angleton was the big, whole, whole books have been written about this guy. James Jesus Angleton III was the guy who at the CIA was the big mole hunter. He was the guy who would chase down anywhere a leak was coming from and had everyone tapped. Uh, and he realized that she was about to light this up and hold a press conference to talk about the ET bodies from outer space and all these secrets that Jack Kennedy had told her just out of spite. She was just furious that, that they had sort of pushed her out of the inner circle. And, you know, the whole thing about a woman scorned. Uh, but unfortunately for Marilyn, it cost her her life. Um, I later, after I got this document, met with a man who, had, who at that time had worked in the intelligence unit of the Los Angeles Police Department who separately had a wiretap on her in her home who confirmed to me this was 100% true. Now, I don't know how many of you know a guy named Burl Ives, who's an a actor and singer, and everyone thinks he was like Frosty the Snowman, but he was actually a very accomplished actor and folk singer and um, very good friends with Marilyn Monroe, Elizabeth Taylor, people like that. And he was on my executive committee for a number of years, and by the time uh, he was involved, I had that document, and I went to visit him. They had moved uh, from... Uh, Montecito and Santa Barbara up to um, uh, Anacortes, Washington. And I was in his room. I was actually sitting on the edge of his bed. He was up there in years. Um, big, jolly guy, great bear of a guy. And um, I shared this document with him. He says, oh my God. And he's a 33rd degree Mason, by the way. He says, we all know, every one of us knew Marilyn had been killed, but we never knew why. We had no idea why. This is why. This is the thing. And so that was also a shot across the bow to the Kennedys. Now, Jack Kennedy had great affection for Marilyn, even though it was indiscreet for, her, for him to continue seeing her. And he was furious that someone in the intelligence community, I don't even think he, he certainly didn't know about this document. He was very upset, is what I understand, that Marilyn was killed by these operatives. And he vowed to try to bring out this information himself. And uh, I think that's why he began to speak a little more openly to this Air Force officer whose audio recording I have. And that was, of course, a year later. This happened in August of 62. The recording with the Air Force officer, that conversation with Jack Kennedy happened in 1963, June. In November, he was assassinated. As the Kennedy was planning, if he had become the president, he was going to dissolve the CIA, get us out of Vietnam, disclose this information, and make peace with the Soviet Union. That's what he was going to do. And those folks in the intelligence community and the warmongers and the profiteers and the military-industrial com uh, complex said, like bloody hell, you will. And that was the end of him. So. And that's why, I mean, although I thought they were joking initially, when I first, is this getting, 
Is this good information for you folks? I hope, I hope it's not too much, but I'm gonna cover an enormous amount today. You've gotta to know the background. So over this time period from 1945, 40s, to 19, early 60s, there developed, a, dec a decision was made. I know this sounds like a joke, because everyone says it. If I tell you, I have to kill you. But that's some, there's some truth to that. So they, the secrecy that got developed around this issue became more and more and more restricted, even from people who were presidents or Senate Intelligence Committee members or uh, members of the cabinet. Because another man who was killed was John Foster Dulles, shoved out of a window. Dulles was killed. Uh, he had been CI director. He uh, was starting to make noises about changing the direction of things. And he was also killed. Dulles Airport's named after him. So they, a decision was made, how do we do this without risking having to continue to engage in the wet works. And uh, there's a guy I know at the CIA who kind of has my back, who has been there for years, PhD guy, who has a team of wet works guys. Wet works are assassinations. So wet works are, wet comes from blood. So, you know, you don't want to pull the trigger on wet works if you don't have to. So they've decided here in the 50s and 60s, to create so much secrecy and have it so compartmentalized and tightly held that they didn't want to risk doing that anymore because it was really disruptive to the nation. And that is really the genesis of unacknowledged special access projects. Now, a special access project just means you have to have uh, you know, the, the clearance to get to it and be read into it, as they say in, in military speak. But an unacknowledged project, I just want to go through a minute how that works. Uh, let's say that this gentleman is a four-star general, and I'm a colonel. I made you a four-star general. But I'm in an unacknowledged special access project dealing with this or some other subject. It can be other things as well. If I am in an unacknowledged project, I am told, and I have one of my most senior military advisors has been in multiple of these. He was in one project that was two to three billion dollars. He knew it was more than two and almost three billion in a project that was off the books, no accounting, president didn't know, Congress didn't know, tightly held, a military guy working with some corporate folks. And he told me, he says, here's how it works. He says, you take, they take you to a SCIF, a Secure Communication Intelligence Facility, SCIF, take all the equipment off of you, any guns off, cell phones, watches, nothing anything metallic. You go into this underground facility and there's a meeting. And it's, he said, hey, you have a come to Jesus talk. And what happens is that you are told that only the people in that room are read into and cleared to this unacknowledged special access project. And if you speak of it outside of that circle of people, there's one person there with a gun and a bullet. He takes the bullet out and he says, it has your name on it if you speak to anyone, and I mean anyone, your wife, the president, your commander, about what we're doing. And that is how it works. This is not a conspiracy theory. I've been in these skiffs. I've been in a couple places, and I can tell you that is exactly how it operates. So one, one of the things I, I want to make really clear about what I'm presenting today, I'm not talking about anything that I don't have firsthand direct knowledge of everything I'm telling you, every bit of it. Because I don't care about conspiracy theories. They're mostly 99% wrong. And I really don't care about the internet chatter. You know, this is 25 years of the most incredible investigative research. And you know, I put over $10 million of my earnings and life into doing to get this far. And I can tell you, if, you, if you're in an unacknowledged project, and I was offered this position, back in 92, and asked my wife about it. Um, and I rejected it. 
I was actually offered $2 billion personally, if a fund with $2 billion in it, if I would shut the hell up, join one of these unacknowledged projects and do what they wanted me to do. And I said, screw you, I'm not doing it. But that's what was offered. And that's when a billion dollars was a lot of money back then. Yeah. Now, you know, they're many a billionaire every week in Silicon Valley. But, you know, in 1992, two billion was a lot of money. Um, so what ended up happening in, in this scenario is that if, if my four-star commanding general calls me in because he's heard rumblings about something that people are working on he didn't know about, under threat of death, tweep, terminate with extreme prejudice, which is death, TWEP, I am to turn to him, even though he's my four-star commanding, I'm only a colonel, and I'm to say, sir, no such project exists. That's how it works. It's illegal, it's unconstitutional, it's criminal, it's just dangerous. Because once you have a breakdown in the rule of law, we're back in the jungle. We're back into Al-Qaeda territory. We're back into the Wild West where there's a lawlessness. And that's what happened. And because of that, no president since Eisenhower has had anything near the level of information on this that would be required for the chief executive. Most CIA directors haven't. There are a few who have and a few who haven't. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about why that's the case in a moment. Who, who's been in and who's out? Dick Helms was in, Woolsey was out. It's a long story, but I mean, I'll try to cover it. I mean, you guys are gonna get more information. It's gonna be TMI, too much information by the end of this, but this, this is why I'm doing this today, is that I wanna leave a record of everything I've learned that's critical for the public in case, you know, I'm 60 now, who knows what will happen to me. So it's important to leave this. But if you're the president, don't assume that you have an all access pass. The presidential daily briefing doesn't have anything really that critical in it and almost never this subject. By the time you had Johnson come around and then you had uh, Nixon, and Nixon, by the way, was vice president for Eisenhower. Nixon actually was pulled in as head of the space committee, the vice president sits as chair of the space committee, into Majestic. This group, MAGIC, M-A-J-I-C is actually what it's called, it's the majority Intelligence Committee, M-A-J-I-C, it's the proper term. Um, and Magic uh, tapped Nixon, and he thought as president, he would be the guy that would disclose this. Because he thought it was time, and he was, finally became president after Jack Kennedy, he felt, swindled him out of the presidency in 1960. And then, of course, Lyndon Johnson inherited the presidency in a sense after the assassination had one term, part of another, the rest of Jack Kennedy's term. But Nixon thought, well, okay, I'm gonna do this. And so a little thing called Watergate happened. Everybody remember Watergate? Those of you too young to remember, it was the break-in over here at this um, office in a luxury apartment on the Potomac. And uh, it was a bag job. Bag men went in and broke into the Democratic National Committee offices to get lists and information, and Nixon ended up covering it up. I mean, it's kind of standard operating procedure. You know, it's like it wasn't really that big of a deal in the sense that it happens all the day, you just don't know it. But there was a guy named Woodard who was ONI, Office of Naval, you know, Bernstein, Woodard and Bernstein, look it up. And off the naval intelligence is where he came from. And suddenly this young reporter has this deep throat. Well, he had an ONI guy give him the information, off the naval intelligence, because Nixon was planning to blow the lid off the secrecy. And the way they took him down was by impeachment rather than by a bullet. That's actually why Nixon was impeached. Now, he did do the Watergate, and he was a crook, but I mean, well, I would say most politicians have engaged in such things. Uh, I know I'm a bit cynical about it, but you know, it's, it's, 
not that unusual for dirty tricks and oppo research to be done against someone else and you have someone go and steal something or rifle through trash to get dirt on someone and that's what they were doing. Uh, and in this case it was a break-in so technically it was illegal and then he covered it up and he got impeached. But the real reason why that became such a big scandal and hit the, the shit hit the fan was that this ONI guy, Woodard, had a source that he worked who had the actionable intelligence on what really happened and there goes the president. And of course, you know, we had Ford who was a part-term, per, you know, the time guy and he had a CIA director, Bill Colby, who was a member of Magic. Bill Colby, I'm giving you like a 50-year history real quick. Is this good? You know, you need this, huh? Colby, and by the way, Nixon had a guy named uh, Dick Helms who did not want me to talk about this at all and said as much to someone who is part of a, a group uh, and that woman is in this room today. But um, what ended up happening with uh, Colby is that as he got older, he was very, very upset. And William Colby, CIA director, who was involved to an extent in the magic operations, decided that it was really a, terrible what was happening to the country. And he's a very patriotic man. He was up there in years and he decided to defect as a lone wolf but an unacknowledged lone wolf. And this is why I'll never allow this again. So let me tell you what really happened to, to Bill Colby. William Colby, Bill Colby, reached out to me through his best friend, a colonel who I will not name, is still living, and an elderly man, um, but a full bird colonel who had been in magic, this committee that in majority intelligence committee that oversees the UFO issue. And he wanted, um, Bill Colby wanted to bring forward the technologies, not the things that fly, but an energy technology based on uh, these classified operations and some seed money, about $50 million in, I guess, kind of gray area seed money to my group so we could bring these technologies out and end the oil and global warming and the poverty and all of that. Now, the person who approached me, a member of my board, uh, and this colonel wouldn't say who the client was. They were gonna set up a secret meeting. I said, I think it's safer if I know who he is. They said, why? I said, because I can put him into a security system. He says, what do you mean? I said, not knowing is dangerous for him. They said, no, he won't do it that way. So I said, okay. So I'm working full time as a trauma doctor, emergency doctor, and we're setting that up. And the week before I'm gonna meet with this former CI director, they find him floating down the Potomac River, made to look like an accident, and he was assassinated. Um, and it was tragic. And I said, I will never do this again. I felt terribly guilty. And, um, his best friend came to my best friend's funeral, Sherry Adamack, who had been helping me for years and who was one of three of us who mysteriously got metastatic cancer the same month. Um, and uh, Simeon, I think you knew Sherry. And um, this colonel came to her wake and he just looked at me, he says, we can't look back. We have to keep putting one foot in front of the other even though we both have had horrible losses. Yeah. So we did, we kept going. And you know, when, when Bill Colby was killed, I thought at that point, well, huh, it's, it's game is over. You know, I was, from 94 until now, I was about to give up on everything. But anyway, um, very, very difficult emotionally and very difficult physically to carry this for you know, 25 years. But you know, I figured this is the pearl of great price. You don't throw this one back in to the water, I and mean, this, is, this is huge. So we decided we would just continue marshalling our energies and, and go forward, but we knew that we couldn't do anything like that again. It had to be open. I mean, I had to know, and to the extent things could, none of this skullduggery, because the secrecy is their domain. If you go to the National Reconnaissance 
office, the, the super secret spy agency that runs all the satellites. Above their entrance, it says, we own the night. You can look, Google it. Uh, and I always say, we need to own the light. We need to own the light of disclosure and the truth and bring this out. So I try to do things to the extent I can, fully, as fully as possible, out in the open. Um, while maintaining the confidences of those who are still living who asked me to do so. But, um, and that's why I'm giving you this much information today. The, the other thing to remember about how Colby's demise evolved was that he was gonna make a run at one of the big central reasons for the secrecy, which I'll get into in a moment. And that's the technology. This is a big science and technology story. Because imagine bringing out a technology that would sit on this podium that would run your house pulling energy from what's been called the zero point energy field that never has to be rebooted for you know, fuel. It's pulling it out of the fabric of space time. And it's estimated that every cubic centimeter of space in this room has enough energy to run the United States for a year if you can tap it. And it has been tapped. So at the root of interstellar transport, aside from the trans-dimensional and anti-gravity, is the energy source. And the energy source is this amazing electromagnetic flux field. In fact, the early man-made UFOs were called flux liners because it's pulling energy out of this infinite ocean, this infinite sea, as Tesla called it. Professor Dirac called it the, the, the Dirac Sea, but it was this infinite field of energy that is at the root of space-time, embedded within space-time. And so bringing out something like that would, of course, immediately make oil, gas, coal, Exxon Mobil, cars, internal combustion engines, jet engines, rockets, uh, diesel, ocean liner, engine, everything you can think of that we use would be obsolete and would be retired very quickly. Um, now, what I just named is several hundred trillion dollars in mineral assets and infrastructure because we also wouldn't need a public utility. Every car and home would be self-sufficient unto itself. I mean, it is a whole new world. Now, we could have had that world before I was born, and we don't have it yet. And as a result, we've decamped in the Middle East with our hegemony, and now we're facing World War III. So there are consequences to this kind of secrecy unintended, and some are intended. But the unintended consequences are really about blowing back on us hard right now, both physically, geophysically, environmentally, geopolitically, and militarily. It's a very dangerous thing to thwart the development of normal technologies to be used for peaceful purposes. Now, that's the big caveat. Use them for peaceful purposes. Now, eventually, one of the things that happened along the lines of, of this was, how do we keep all this secret? <laughs> well, wet works kill people. Compartmentalization, unacknowledged special access projects, nobody outside the project knows. A big one is ridicule. I have a document from 1950s where they talk about engaging Disney Studios, which had done a lot of the OSS propaganda films in World War II. And Walt Disney was an asset of the CIA. And believe it or not, I mean, everyone thinks of cartoons, but so they, they were going to, they engaged Disney Studios to make Flying Saucer and Little Green Men films, you know, you know, ha, ha, ha. And it ridiculed the subject so that respectable people would say, well, you're a kook if you're dealing with UFOs and ET issue. And that was done deliberately, and this was part of what I referred to in that earlier document, the psychological warfare value of the subject. How do you create the psychological nexus so that the subject becomes subject non grata? Like a person non, persona non grata, it's a subject non grata. Uh, it, it's unwelcome, it's, it has ridicule associated with it. And an Air Force major told me, who's one of our disclosure project witnesses who uh, was present when we shot and killed an ET on the tarmac at McGuire Field there in New Jersey, his testimony is quite riveting if you've read the materials. Um, and you know, he was saying, look, the, really the way this has been kept secret more than anything is just sheer ridicule. Nobody wants to be laughed at. Everyone doesn't, everyone's concerned what their friends might think. 
because, you know, where's the tinfoil hat you're supposed to be wearing? So this ridicule got ramped up in 1953 in the psychological warfare programs. So by the time, you know, we came on the stage, gee, we're 60 some, you know, 50, 60 years into a hole of ridicule and denial and uh, countermeasures and everything else that, how do you fix this? You know, it's very difficult because most reporters and media people don't want to be ridiculed. Um, nor do scientific and people and professors and government folks. I mean, there's so many people in the Congress I've met with, very interested, know this is real. I'll say, will you hold a hearing on this? They go, oh no, it'd be the end of my career. I'd be, I'd be the laughing stock. I'd be Senator Moonbeam or Congressman, you know, tinfoil head or whatever. So that ridicule, which was ramped up in the 50s, has been very effective, incredibly effective. Um, and, and that's one of the hard problems I've faced as well. Although, you know, as a medical doctor, luckily I was known as a very good emergency doctor before I got on Larry King Live and started doing stuff like this. But um, if it had been the other way around, I probably would have never been hired. Um, really, yeah, so <laughs> I, was, I was careful in my timing because I did have a family of four children to support. Um, Luckily, they're all out of college now, so. Um, now, the next thing I want if, to, if the next document, if you move on from Marilyn Monroe's tragedy, and it will be time at the end of today for you to ask questions. I'm sure your, your mind must be swirling by now about a lot of things. Um, and this is a, the next document is the Peterson Memo, Arlington Institute. So this is the meeting that never happened with me and the CIA director. Very interesting. Look at the date. 3rd of December, 1993. The meeting between me and the sitting CIA director was the 13th of December, 1993. And is that document up? And the CIA director, R. James Woolsey, who, when information about my meeting came out after he had left office, denied it ever happened. Luckily, I could call him in a flat-footed lie. I always tell people in Washington, how do you know these politicians and lawyers are lying? Their lips are moving. If their lips are moving, they're lying. I know it's a very cynical thing to say, but unfortunately very true. Um, but this document, which I'm not going to go all the way through, but some of the some of the information is very, very important. I talked to Woolsey this morning, and he suggested getting together, underline his underline. Um, project Starlight that's referred to here was the coalition I put together before the Disclosure Project, which no one knew about, where I was trying to get the President, President Clinton, to lead the disclosure on this. And um, they, it's a very interesting document because on the second page it says, remember the most powerful people in the world will have a deep compelling interest in our activities and will use everything in italics at their disposal to effect their objectives, very threatening. And then he suggests that I get an encrypted portable phone because my kitchen doesn't have one. I mean, the whole thing is like such, now here I am, of course, you know, I'm like 30 some years old, I'm an emergency doctor, and I'm being asked to come up and brief the sitting CIA director because, and if you read this carefully, it states in there, he's made inquiries and no one's telling him anything. This is a sitting director of the CIA. This is the proof the meeting took place, and there is other proof. Now, what, what, what the hell is going on that a sitting CIA director doesn't know anything about the most top secret CIA project. Illegal, outrageous, unconstitutional, criminal. And when I found this out, now remember this is 22 years ago almost, it was a shock to me. 
because I was raised like most people. I thought, you know, well, there's a president, there are all these spooks, and there's a chain of command, and it operates. I didn't know about unacknowledged special access projects. I certainly could not have imagined that the man who puts together the presidential daily briefing would be kept secret on stuff that I had collected unbelievable amounts of evidence for the existence of UFOs, extraterrestrial intelligence, et cetera, and so on. But that was the case. And when I met with this man for nearly three hours, it became quite clear to me that it was not a prevarication. I really thought that he was saying that just as a way of blowing me off, uh, or, you know, not blowing me off, but sort of saying, eh, you know, I want to meet with you to find out what you know, but I actually do know, and I'm going to pretend like I don't know. No, this man, and my wife can attest to this, was shaken to his foundation. The cover story for the meeting was a dinner party in the D.C. area, which is typical. Um, the wives were invited as cover. Um, terrible thing to say, but it's true. Um, so my wife was there, I was there. The CIA director and his wife, who's chief operating officer of the National Academy of Sciences, was there, and my host, uh, John Peterson, and his wife. Uh, interestingly, she didn't know who was coming to dinner until that afternoon. He wouldn't tell her. And then she finds out, like two hours before we appear, there's this UFO expert and the CIA director and his wife coming for dinner. Can you imagine being that wife? That was an inter I'm sure that night was an interesting conversation after we all left. But, um, that's how these things are done. The, the, the real tragedy of it, though, is that if you have a breakdown in government this severe, those of you who are students of governance, where you can have a CIA director or senior members of the military who are being left out of something very important and which hundreds of billions of dollars per year are going into, then you have no government. So the deep national security state from 1950s until today has devolved into this sub rosa, unacknowledged, inter not international, transnational entity with representation in the UK, Canada, Australia, Brazil, China, Russia, former Soviet Union, which on this issue work together like this. It is not responsive to the body politic. It is not responsive to the uh, heads of government or even the heads of committees and cabinet level people. There are some cabinet level people, however, who have known, I mentioned a few. There was a, a CIA director known as George H.W. Bush and the CIA headquarters is now named after him. He was a member and is a member of MAGIC. But then there are others like Woolsey who, who weren't, wouldn't be told anything. Some presidents have been given a little information and some have been told nothing. Why? Well, here's how it works. It took me a long time to figure out something very simple. I call this a soul biopsy. <clears throat> because doctors are talking about biopsies, but it's a psychological analysis. So let's say this gentleman is the incoming director of the CIA. Um, the outgoing director of the CIA is me. As incoming director of the CIA, they've taken your life apart and they know what your values are. If your values are that you would not go along with an illegal, criminal, unconstitutional effort, and engage in assassinations that were illegal and other things, they will never tell you about this. And even if you're the president that's incoming, this is what happened to Jimmy Carter. And I know this for a fact. Jimmy Carter got elected and the outgoing CI director was, guess who? George H.W. Bush. George H.W. Bush, when he was called in uh, and they had the transition meeting for between November and January when they have the transition and they're standing up the new cabinet, 
was asked personally, face to face, by Jimmy Carter, and I met with someone who was there, about the UFO issue. And Bush said, I'm not going to tell you in a very derisive way about that. Go see if you can get it from the Congressional Research Service. Literally. Brushed him off. And Carter was stunned. Because Carter had had a UFO sighting when he was governor of Georgia. I have his report form that he filed officially. Signed, Jimmy Carter. He ran in 1976 on ending UFO secrecy, actually. So he put together a White House study on UFOs, which we have disclosure pro project witnesses that attest there too, and they were reaching out to Stanford Research International to do SRI to do the study for them because they couldn't get anything from outgoing CIA Director Bush. And that entity, SRI, had some people come in and threatened them and said, basically, if you want to receive any more contracts from the Department of Defense, or the US government, you will refuse to do this study for the White House. We have that as an affidavit signed from someone involved. So um, now, this is very extraordinary, but it's, we, have docu we have legal documents to prove it. So Carter was boxed out of this. And not long ago, he was at a, a, a signing ceremony, signing uh, guitars in Spain to raise money for the Carter Center a few years ago. And a very well-known, I think his name's John Williams, well-known classical guitarist um, who's on our team was there and said, you know, at dinner, someone asked Carter, what was it like to be the most powerful man in the world? And Jen, uh, President Carter said, I don't think I was that man. And everyone just thought he was joking. And he said, well, there are certain things I wasn't allowed to know about. And someone very, in a ridiculing way, said, ha, 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 what, like UFOs? And President Carter said, yes, that and more, referring to these energy and technology things. Uh, and so Carter uh, wasn't joking. And it is true that he did not get access the whole time he was president because he would have ended the secrecy and they knew it. It's also why he was a one-term president. Now we had after him Ronald Reagan, or Reagan as I call him. R -A -Y. So a colonel who reached out to me was one of the guys who putting together the SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative, um, Star Wars. Um, and he actually met with Carter and Reagan. Uh, Carter was a hard sell, Reagan was a soft sell on the billions to go into Star Wars. Now, the way it worked is that the Star Wars was always a cover story for targeting in space interstellar vehicles using these scalar weapons, not lasers. Not, not, if it's at the speed of light, it's not fast enough. Everything important is faster than the speed of light. Um, and so what happened is that he, at that point, uh, got convinced. They sent just the right people in to convince Reagan that there was an existential th alien threat. Basically what Werner von Braun warned on his deathbed about, which we'll get to in a moment. And so Reagan bought into it. That's why you can Google this. At the UN, he said, wouldn't our job of uniting the world be easier if we could unite against a common alien threat? I'm paraphrasing, but you can look this up. Actually, Bill Clinton recently said that on Jimmy Kimmel, something very similar. The reason that happens is because there is a prevailing need for people who are in certain positions to be given what is, I call targeted and tailor-made disinformation. Information that is geared towards scaring the hell out of them so they go along with the agenda of militarism as opposed to peaceful contact with these civilizations. And it's very, not hard to do if you have a certain orientation, if you have a certain mindset based on fear, xenophobia, us versus them, that whole mindset. So that's really the criteria. Whether someone is pulled in the loop of this secrecy in government or not 
has to do with what their values are, what their psychological profile is, whether they will go along with the agenda of secrecy. If they will not go along with the agenda of secrecy, you're not gonna, they're not gonna tell you anything. I don't care if you are the President of the United States or the CIA Director or the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. But there are, have been people who do know in those same positions. Why? Because they were willing to go along with this chicanery. Now, if the next document you can put up, it's just a partial list of the sort of VIPs and government official I briefed. It goes three pages long. It's 50, 60, 70, and this is just a few, a few of them. Every single one of these people, without exception, and you can scroll down through them uh, and just flip through. I'm not gonna go through them all, we don't have time. It is a lot of work having private meetings with this many people. Um, every single one of these people, from Senator Claiborne Pell to the CIA director to the head of intelligence for the Joint Chat staff to the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency, the biggest intelligence gathering entity in the Pentagon, every single one of these people wanted to know but had been denied access to these unacknowledged special access projects. Every single one of them. That is the proof we have. If we ever had to go to court to prove that the operation is illegal. And these people, the ones still living, would be subpoenaed. Um, because, believe me, and I have more, um, one of them that you see on page two here is uh, Lord Hill Norton. And if you go to this next document, this is a five-star admiral. How many people have heard of Lord Hill Norton? He's actually a great guy. He passed away not long ago. I don't mind sharing these, these couple letters. I have a whole file with him. Um, he asked me to come to his uh, estate in England and brief him back in, I believe it was 1990s sometime. And uh, he was a, a five-star admiral, what they used to call Sea Lord. And um, Lord Hill Norton, is that the one? Is that the right one? Yeah. He had found out through other sources that UFOs were real and that there was a big operation in the UK that was this transnational, deep national security state working with the British. But he was head of the Ministry of Defense and as such was head of MI5 and MI6. He was also head of the military committee for NATO. He had no knowledge of these projects the entire time he was in government. And when I met with him at his cottage, and you know what's kind of cute about it, at the second document, if you go to the next one, he says, I thoroughly enjoyed our talk when you came in August. This was in August of, uh, I guess it was 1995. Um, uh, and I am grateful to you for your time. I read all the materials you left me and I intend to read it all again. Uh, I also shared it with Countess Murray, who shares our interest. I have an idea you may have met her some time ago. I meet a lot of folks. I find your latest brief on the national security and tele implications of the UFO subjects very clear and very convincing, and it goes on. It's a beautiful letter, um, and, and things he was gonna do with the European Parliament and whatnot. He, he, he died not being able to accomplish as much as he wanted to with the British government because I had to explain to him why he never knew anything about this. And it's a very hard thing to sit with someone like a CIA director or someone like this, who's one of the most powerful people in the military and intelligence field in the world, and tell them, you just were not in the loop. <laughs> and he, he basically said to me, well, why didn't they tell me? And it was, he was a little hurt and kind of petulant. And I said, sir, I'm gonna answer your question with a question. What would you have done if you'd found out there, there was a transnational entity, unacknowledged, running unconstitutionally in your country and mine, engaging in assassinations, keeping from the planet technologies that would save the Earth from environmental destruction and eliminate poverty within a generation, and that they are using these technologies to try to provoke, as urgent provocateurs, an interstellar conflict? and World War III, and that they were completely off the reservation without any controls from the chief executive 
or the uh, legitimate governments of the world. And he hopped up and down. He's this little, he's this little guy with piercing blue. He says, I wouldn't have stood for, for a bloody minute. I said, well, that's why they didn't tell you. He says, what do you mean? He thought I was being impertinent. I said, because they knew you wouldn't go along with that agenda. Therefore, you are out of the loop. That's how it works. It's that simple. So you basically accumulate people who are enormously evil and who want to see terrible damage done to the planet because at their core, they love war and they love conflict. They do not want peace to break out. As one of them said to me, heaven forbid we should have peace on this planet, too many people would be out of business. Too many of us would be out of business. Very cynical, but true. The next document is from one of my advisors to Admiral Tom Wilson. And it's about setting up a briefing for him. And I only put this up here because some people have challenged me, did you really have meetings with folks like this? Yes, absolutely. Um, and it was on my birthday in 1995, the first letter was written. I ended up meeting with him in 97 in April. Uh, but he helped us in a number of ways prior to that, as did this Admiral Kramer, who set up my meetings at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, the facility to which the crash DT remains went in the uh, 1940s uh, in, in Dayton, Ohio. And um, this meeting was another one where I was able to provide to him uh, some very important information prior to the meeting, including a 1991 document, which has not been declassified, and I will go to that one next. It's the National Reconnaissance Office uh, document. And um, that document is basically a security alert. And the reason it's important is not so much for its content or on the next page, which is a warning that a group of UFO bu buffs were trying to penetrate the perimeter of Area 51, so it's called. Nobody calls it that, really. It's a, the Nellis Range. But this was generated, and you can see the date, July 1991. And take a note of the distribution list, please. And we're going to get back to that in a moment. But it's a security blue fire, which is a code name, uh, 1991, Commander's Net, Royal Ops, Cosmic Ops. So Cosmic Clearance, you've heard of this? Not a myth, it's real. Magops, Magi, as the majority is the magic, M-A-J-I-C, Ops. Uh, and it goes to a whole bunch of them, Nellis Division, all these code numbers, and you get down to some really interesting things. MOC is Military Operating Center, and MOA is a Military Operating Area, uh, and SOG is a Special Operations Team. But you get into Red Flag, Dart East, Dart South, Pahut Mesa, Sally Corridor, Groom Lake, Dreamland, Blackjack Team, Blackjack Control is at the Edwards Complex in, in California. Roulette Team, Aquatech, Sea Spray, and others. Um, now, it's not clear to me when I, who gave me this why they blacked out a couple of things. Maybe it was things that they were involved with personally and they didn't want to get um, fingered. But this a secret document went to the Admiral prior to our meeting, and he actually recognized one of these entities. And he made an inquiry, and it was being run by a contractor. We're going to get to these, this next. And the contractor, one of these corporate contractors, when he called them up, he said, I'm Admiral Tom Wilson. At that time, he was head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I want to be read into this project. Guess what happened? They said, sir, you don't have a need to know. Now, this is the guy who puts together the intelligence briefings for the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States. He was told, you don't have a need to know. And Admiral Wilson said, god damn it, if I don't have a need to know, who does? 
They said, sir, we cannot discuss this with you further. They hung up and blocked his line. Now, this all happened before the stand-up meeting I did where uh, Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon, and myself and my military advisor and a few other people met with the admiral uh, in a stand-up, what's called a stand-up briefing. I was doing the presenting. Um, that was supposed to be 45 minutes. It went for two or three hours. He kept canceling appointments downstream. And this was at the Pentagon. And so I said, well, you know, sir, don't feel bad. And he looked at me. He said, well, who else is in this situation where this group is blocking access, who are in the national security uh, apparatus? I said, well, the president, the CIA director, et cetera. And I started naming them, and he was just... The, the fear in his eyes, the palpable fear and anger that something this important that is real and legitimate, he knew it was, could escape the oversight of folks who have the security of the United States in their hands. So basically, they're trying to navigate without IFR. They're trying to navigate without radar through the dangers of the world because the most important technologies and the most important information and the most critical national security secrets are completely off their, out of their uh, scope, off their radar. And yet they're responsible for keeping America safe and they're responsible for protecting us and they're responsible for responding to threats. And so at the end of the meeting, I asked him, I said, well, Admiral, do you think you can help us? And he just sat back in his head, this big chair, he sat back, he said, <laughs> he says, look, he says, what I've learned from this meeting is that there is an illegal operation that has hundreds of billions of dollars and over the years trillions that has technologies that can do circles around my B-2 stealth bomber, which is the best thing I know about. How am I going to take them on? And I said, well, it can't be through a military engagement. It has to be through infiltration. It has to be through convincing them to come. He says, I don't know how to do that. I had, they won't give me access. And moreover, I can't take any action unless the president authorizes it. And at that time, the president was uh, Bill Clinton. And I said, well, no, he won't do that. He says, why? He says, well, we briefed the president. And his best friend came to my home and said that if he did this, he would end up like Jack Kennedy. And I'm quoting. He says, well, there you are then. Point, set, match. And I said, well, you know, someone's got to do it. <laughs> Invariably, these people say, well, you can do it. And I learned, if you look at, there's a movie my wife and I saw this past week uh, called Bridge of Spies, and you realize there's this attorney named Donovan in it. It's a true story based on the Gary Powers U2 shoot down. And uh, he was sort of the expendable guy. I'm the expendable guy. I'm the guy that doesn't matter if they get killed. Because I'm basically that's what Clinton's people told me. It doesn't matter if you get killed. We don't want the president to get killed. So, I mean, I know that's ugly, but it's the truth. So, <laughs> so... So I'm, that's why I'm doing it. Um, so this document, the reason it's so critical is that it actually has the action one. This is the first document on the top of the large briefing that President Obama got when he became president. And John Podesta, who was his the guy who put together the Obama White House, was the man that we provided this for. Because Podesta has publicly come out, as you know, in favor of disclosure and ending secrecy. So basically, it was from me to Podesta to Obama. And of course, I mean, I didn't expect Obama to be able to do anything about it because having these project code numbers and being president doesn't give you access control. You know the difference between knowledge of something and access control. You can know about something, but if, you, if they're, they're non-responsive to your orders, like they were to this admiral, it doesn't matter if you're a general or the president or a CIA director. Because they're basically going to say, buzz off, we have more power than you do, and go away. And that's how it operates. That is how it operates. This is naked, raw power. It's how it works. So 
This next uh, document I want to share, unfortunately, this is, did not come out. It's the uh, uh, Congressman Cox. As you know, he was SEC um, head secretary for um, W. Bush. Uh, but back when he was a congressman from Orange County, a good friend of mine who knew him set up a briefing between me and the congressman at his offices in uh, Orange County. And he was on several key committees, uh, Armed Services Committee, et cetera, and so on. And he wanted to know about the UFO issue, and I said, okay, well, I'll come in and I'll brief you. And he said, well, this has never been brought up at a briefing. I said, no, you wouldn't be, because the, I'm, I briefed members personally of the Senate Intelligence Committee and Foreign Relations Committee and House Government and Oversight Chairman and everyone you can think of personally face-to-face. -face. And in every case, they have been completely without access. Uh, and when they make an inquiry, they're told no such project exists. It doesn't exist. It's unacknowledged. Unacknowledged. Doesn't exist. And I, he says, well, I would like to know. He says, where the heck are these things going on? And who are the corporate entities? And where are the bases? So that was the genesis of the famous Cox memo, <laughs> which, you know, became kind of infamous um, because I wrote it to him. and. I basically did a sub subject of a, a brief summary of the people who I briefed who don't know and a course of action that he needs to take. Unfortunately, that document didn't come out. It got scrambled by the electronic gremlins in the computer unless he's fixed it. No, he hasn't. So, um, so basically, I describe who is not able to do this and but where the places are. And that was the genesis of, of this, which is the facilities list. And I want to go through this very quickly of where the key facilities are. Now, keep in mind, these are all run by a hybridized entity. It's part government unacknowledged special access project, compartmented, deep black, transnational security state, and three quarters corporate. The action is in the corporate sector. Um, but at each of these bases, there are contractors who run the operations. Do you understand how this works? In other words, the government doesn't do that much. <laughs> The government does WFO, work for others. So they issue contracts. So you'll have Bechtel Corporation, or you'll have Lockheed Martin, or you'll have whatever. So, but the key facilities I want to go through, and there are others. This is a, a list um, that I've update, I updated it um, for the president in 2009. Um, uh, a very chief one is Edwards Air Force Base. And there's a whole constellation there. Haystack Butte, China Lakes, George Air Force Base, they retired Norton Air Force Base. Tabletop Mountain Observatory, which is run ostensibly by NASA, and Blackjack Control. So I had a source at Blackjack Control associated with the Edwards-related facilities, but the Blackjack team you saw on that list was Nellis. So there's Blackjack Control and Blackjack Team. And then there are aerospace facilities, and these are all um, DUMS, deep underground military bases, um, or UGBs for sure, underground bases. Um, Northrop, the Ant Hill Tihon Ranch. McDonnell Douglas, the Lano plant. Lockheed Martin, Hellendale. Then Phillips Labs and the North Edwards facility. And I will add that since then, a newer facility called the Cube, which is up past Lancaster, Palmdale, up in the high desert, outside of, uh, in the Edwards range and classified airspace is uh, a Lockheed Martin Skunk Works facility where the state of the art uh, R&D is going on. Keep in mind that Lockheed and Northrop have multiple generations since 1954 of what you would call a UFO, man-made UFO, that are um, as the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works said to uh, several people on my team, including Jan Harzan, the new head of uh, MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, he's an IBM executive that's retired. I've been friends with him since the 20s, I mean the, not the 20s, since the 90s. He is a man who is of great integrity and he actually was at the meeting along with several other of my friends when, when Ben Rich, the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works, a super secret, it's where the U-2 spy plane in that movie came from, said, 
we can take E.T. home. We already have the technologies to take E.T. home and ended his presentation with a, with a slideshow of a black disc going out into space. Sounds fantastic. No, it's not. It's the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works. So we're flying around on jets, which are basically a vacuum tube that's pressurized with a bomb, a pre-positioned bomb called Explosive Jet Fuel A that you're flying on, thousands of gallons of, when we have had these things since the 50s. How ridiculous. We're sending our astronauts up on rockets that blow up and kill them like the shuttle astronauts when we've had these things since the 50s. This is criminal. It's outrageous. But that's the way it is. So this is how it's developed. And then I just wanted to let you know that this new facility, the Cube, is I have an engineer that I've met with who, who works in that facility. And they work on not just the um, propulsion systems, but also the electronic warfare systems and the bio nanotechnology, which we'll get to in, at the sec after our break. And those are the things that the UFO retail world of books and movies and conferences would call aliens. These are man made. They have integrated circuits in their brains and they walk around, they're little gray or reptilian or creepy looking things. These are man-made, 100%. And I know the men working on that, but the cube is associated, that's one facility associated with those. Another facility is Dulce, another one is Pine Gap. So the other, of course, you know, you've all heard Nellis Complex, it's Area 51. More specifically, it's S4, S9, and S12. Those are compartmented areas. You have to have a password and biometrics to get into them. Pahoot Mesa and Area 19 and Groom Lake. These are all things that have been provided to our government officials. Uh, in New Mexico, you have the Los Alamos National Laboratory. It has an underground connector, underground, that goes to the Dulce complex, which most people don't think can really exist because you go to Dulce, there's nothing there. Remember what this simple fact, nothing critical is above the surface of the ground. It's either in space or it's underground, everything, including White House facilities and Pentagon. Everything critical is underground. The, um, and the Kirkland Air Force Base has the Sandia National Laboratories uh, and the De Defense uh, Nuclear Agency, Phillips Labs, again, Manzano Mountain Weapons Storage Facility and underground complex that connects Coyote Mountain test site north end of Manzano, the White Sands Complex, and again, the Dulce Complex. So uh, Kirkland Air Force Base, and that's outside, of course, Albuquerque. I've been there. Um, in Arizona, a key facility is Fort Huachuca. It's a underground base, most of it that's critical. It's uh, Army Intelligence Headquarters. There is a storage facility where a man, as of the 1970s, who was on my team, would work, would worked in it. And at that time, they had nine extraterrestrial spacecraft that had been down using these electromagnetic pulse scalar weapons and a whole lot of different ET species that were frozen there. Um, and that's at Fort Huachuca, ironically near Tombstone. Uh, and um, there, the other uh, ones that I just want to mention, uh, Cheyenne Mountain, uh, it, which is under the mountain in Colorado Springs, has a, de has a dedicated area for just uh, the deep space network tracking of interstellars that are uh, in our solar system. And one of my military advisors, a man who's been in many of these unacknowledged special access projects, actually was in that facility and got to see this console 50 where they had tracked, and he said that they had tracked um, an object at, at that time that was in our solar system that was 26 miles in diameter, an artificial ET object moving, as he put it, under its own steam. He's a Navy guy. I said, I don't think it's working with steam, but yeah, you're right. Um, another critical facility is the Lawrence Livermore Labs. Uh, the Pine Gap underground facility in Australia. I have a picture actually of the above ground facility there that um, a man who worked there sent to me. Uh, the Redstone Arsenal underground complex in Alabama um, that also has an association with the Marshall Space Flight Center. Uh, and in Utah, one of the most critical, and this is the most critical one that's new, is the Dugway Proving Grounds outside of Provo 
uh, and this is classified airspace above and no access by ground. Above ground, you don't see much and everything is underground. Um, <clears throat> Richard Foch, this Naval Research Labs official, was out there with some generation five or six or whatever night scopes doing an operation and he looked out and, and he saw these objects coming out from underground that then zipped over and that were these massive disc and triangular shape anti-gravity objects that were ours and some were just sitting out there watching him and uh, that's outside of uh, Provo out in the desert. Um, so that is a very key, and that one is mostly manned by folks who are part of the Mormon corporate empire, which if I were to rank who has what kind of say-so over policy on this, that would rank certainly ahead of the president or Congress. Um, I won't comment further than that. This is not to make an aspersion to rank and file Mormons, it's just this is the, how that operation works. Um, the agencies in the U.S. government are associated with this. Um, uh, the AFOSI, Air Force Office of Special Investigation, and of course, compartmented operations at CIA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Administration, the Defense Intelligence Agency. Now, notwithstanding, I briefed the general who was head of it. He wasn't given any information, but we have disclosure project witnesses who are DIA uh, assigned contractors who had were very involved in ET and UFO technology issues. Um, certain compartmented operations at the FBI being tightly held, um, and every military intelligence division, Army, Air Force, Navy, have compartmented, unacknowledged operations that feed into this magic committee. The National Reconnaissance Office, the National Security Agency, again, a very compartmented operation, certainly nothing that Edward Snowden had access to, to my knowledge, although it's been asked and the various space commands. Um, private corporate entities include a BDM Corporation, Bechtel Corporation does most of the underground base um, construction. I know that the tunnel being built from Los Alamos over to Dulce. For years, people heard, you look and Google this, the Taos, T-A-O-S, hum. A lot of New Agers thought it was like Gaia singing or something. I'm going, no. <laughs> there was a massive nuclear-powered tunneling device that was going from Los Alamos over to Dulce, and as it was going, it goes through bedrock and classifies it into this massive tunnel that then anti-gravity electromagnetic vehicles transport people, people carriers, underneath the ground. And as it was going through that bedrock, it caused this vibration. But that was being operated by Bechtel, and I was at a meeting with Stephen Bechtel once, and you know, it's, they are very key. And Booz Allen Hamilton, of course, is who Snowden worked for, but they're a key contractor. They do have a compartmented operation dealing with this. Boeing Aerospace, EG&G, very key facility for creating um, electronics and also uh, the state-of-the-art uh, nanotechnology implants that are put into uh, abduction victims, people that think they had contact with ETs, but they're actually being abducted by military and corporate folks. Um, E-Systems, which is now a division of Raytheon, uh, Lockheed Martin, I've mentioned McDonnell Douglas is now part of Boeing. Um, MITRE Corporation, M-I-T-R-E, very key in terms of anti-gravity and high tech. It's here in the D.C. area and other places. Uh, North Grumman. Uh, I mentioned Phillips Labs before, Rockwell International, SAIC, and this is one of the crown jewels. SAIC is a company, Science Applications International Corporation. Um, Admiral Bobby Ray Inman is a, has for years been a member of this magic committee, uh, along with Dick Cheney and Papa Bush, but the SAIC, he had been National Security Agency head. He moved from National Security head over to the board of SAIC. Um, and in a little side story, interestingly, when I asked uh, Senator Barry Goldwater when I was at his home some years ago, and um, you know, he'd run for president in 64, but he always had an interest in this, but had never been told anything. And he, I, I, we started comparing notes of who we knew, and he said, who can, how can I help you? I said, well, if you could reach out to some of these people on this uh, magic committee, it'd be great. And so, you know, we named some names. He didn't know the ones I, I mentioned. And then he, I said, well, Admiral Bobby Ray Inman, he says, oh, Bobby Ray, we've been friends for years. I said, well, get hold of him. Give him a jingle, would you? So he did. Biggest mistake of his life. <laughs> he got hold of me. He says, 
I can't make any more phone calls like that for you. He tore me apart. He tore me a new one. But uh, Admiral Inman, uh, definitely a magic member, as are other chief people on the, the SAIC. But it's compartmentalized. So, you know, most people work on conventional things there. A TRW, uh, Village Supercomputing, uh, Whack and Hut, um, security, there's a lot of security for magic. And then there are others as well. Um, so, you know, some of these are, are, th are ones most, you know, most people have never heard a lot of these corporations. They're huge and they have enormous reach. And I think that what you have to understand is that there is certainly not limited to that list, but it feeds into a system. And most people don't even understand how it works. And I always tell people, go back and look at the interview of Denise McKenzie, worked for SAIC. She got a job there as a sort of clerical administrative person. She was in an office. It's kind of like the mafia. You know how the mafia will have like a pizza parlor or uh, some little shop and they'll come in and you know that's the storefront and but it's actually laundering money and they're doing their drugs and pimps through the back door. That's how this works. So she was in this office at SAIC and it was an office, it was you know running multi-million dollar contracts for the US government and she, she said what is this? There's nothing going on here. And she went to this file cabinet and there were just all these dummied up reports that would go back to Capitol Hill to justify the money. And when she started asking about it, they said, don't ask about this. And what, what she basically was told, this office receives the money. We generate false reports back to the president and to Congress. That money then passes out of this office to a black project dealing with UFOs, and electronics, anti-gravity, stuff like this. So when you get to some of the accounting, I met recently with a big, uh, one of the big four accounting firms. They said, yeah, this is exactly how it works. If you go to, they'll, they'll basically say, here's what we're doing. And if you try to penetrate further to actually get to a granular level of where the money is going, they'll say, well, you don't have a need to know. That's the top secret special compartmented intelligence and, and basically you have to take their word for it. So it all gets rubber stamped by the big four auditing firms. But it's very illegal. Uh, you'll remember in the film Sirius, Donald Rumsfeld, the day before 9-11, I'm not sure he knew he was being filmed, said $2.3 trillion unaccounted for. Recently I heard, found out from a good source, it's $8.5 trillion now. So there's $8.5 trillion that have basically been embezzled, misappropriated, used without the knowledge of the Congress or the President. That's a lot of money, even for America. So that is exactly how it operates. But if you take that one little example from SAIC and multiply it through all these corporations and all these different government offices, that's how the funding mechanism works. Does that make sense to folks? So, I hope that made sense to you guys. I'm going to say let's take about a 15-minute break to stretch and to have a, a, a bathroom break. And when we come back, I'm going to go back into deep knowledge of how the funding works and really what the agenda is behind the secrecy. Thank you very much. All right. So if someone up there can ask people to come have a seat, thank you. Hope you guys had to stretch your legs a little bit. I know this is a long presentation, but it needs to be. So thank you. I'm glad everyone uh, made it back. So in the next uh, hour and 45 minutes, I want to cover uh, enough material so that you might have a few questions at the end. You probably have a few thousand questions already. One thing I want to go into just very quickly is the key role that control systems play within the media and the scientific community. Now this sort of surprises a lot of people and some people they're not surprised. Um, first, let's deal with science. Um, one thing you have to remember about science is that scientists are humans first and scientists second, right? All of us. 
Um, and there are scientists who uh, pose as objective scientific folks who are on the payroll of various agencies. For example, in this cache of documents I, ha I received, um, there's a very famous uh, astro astronomer, astrophysicist at Harvard named uh, Dr. Um, uh, Donald uh, Menzel. And Menzel was the chief UFO debunker who um, went around telling people none of this existed in the 1960s and all through that era. And he was on many panels and he was the person who would look at evidence and then say, not true, not true, not true. Um, it turned out, I have a document from the CIA where it talks about their contract with Dr. Donald Menzel at Harvard and it said, but it cannot be acknowledged that he is being paid by us because the public needs to believe that he's an objective scientist telling the public from the perch of respectability at Harvard that this isn't true. So until the time of his death, this wasn't known. Now in this cache of documents I got in 1994, officially released by the CIA, the provenance of this document is not in question. It names him. So just extrapolate that out, how easy it is to do that. Same thing with um, a guy named uh, Professor Condon. Professor Condon was the head of the Condon Committee at the University of Colorado that had a contract in 1969 to look into UFOs so that the Air Force could determine whether to close Project Blue Book or not. Project Blue Book was actually a public relations stunt, mostly, to collect information from the public because there was so much outcry from the public of sightings and things that had happened, and the public, uh, particularly uh, Congressman Gerald Ford at the time, uh, was furious that they were debunking events that had happened in Michigan that his constituents said were absolutely right there, here, E.T. Kraft right here. And um, uh, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who, who later came clean, is also an astrophysicist, um, made the famous comment that it was swamp gas. And later, of course, he said, we knew it wasn't swamp gas, we knew it was E.T. Kraft, and he left Project Blue Book as their chief consultant and started the Center for UFO Studies. Um, there in Chicago. But uh, Professor Condon uh, around this time was asked to head up an objective scientific committee to look into whether there was anything, ver any veracity to UFOs. It was, there was a lot of publicity around it. And like all government committees, um, it's always, when they form a committee, they already have it, uh, it's a done deal. It's just wind addressing. So he uh, headed up this committee, a lot of scientific people, and um, Dr. Uh, Robert Wood, a Cornell PhD, worked for McDonnell Douglas, now part of Boeing. And um, actually, um, Dr. Wood, who is one of our Disclosure Project witnesses, um, it told me, and it's in our, his very lengthy testimony I have, you have to understand I have hundreds of hours of this kind of testimony on videotape. When he was working for McDonnell Douglas, old man McDonald himself asked him to look into UFOs and gather evidence. And so he began to do this and he discovered a number of things. A, they were real. B, they were interplanetary. C, they were using a type of uh, gravity control propulsion. And D, most interestingly, in many of the things that he look, looked into, um, he found that the ETs had electronic devices that were what I call technology-assisted consciousness and consciousness-assisted technologies, meaning that there was a trans-dimensional nexus between the electronics of these communication devices. Um, I mean, you know, this goes at the speed of light. It's just junk, really. It's 1800s technology, and you know, it's the Morse code. Um, uh, no offense, Apple, uh, but, um, but they had technologies that interfaced seamlessly with an electronics that would pick up directed intended thought, and, which is absolutely true. Um, and actually the founder of Facebook, Zuckerberg, started talking about a, a, a thought switch to interface with computers. Um, I don't know if he's been reading my material, but anyway, I started writing about that in 1990, 1991. And, uh, when uh, Dr. Wood saw my comprehensive assessment of the UFO subject, 
uh, which was written in 91, it got kind of moved through the agency and the aerospace community. And I was just starting this project, very obscure at that time, just this country doctor in North Carolina rattling around in an ER. And um, it, it made its way over to McDonnell Douglas and I got this phone call from Dr. Wood and he said, you have no idea how right you are. How do you know this? I said, well, I've had contact and it's quite obvious. I mean, if you have any thinking person, you're not dealing with electronics that are at the speed of light or travel that's the speed of light, it's too slow because some of these are from other galaxies, like the picture we have of that one ET that's from Andromeda, two and a half million light years from here. You know, they're not getting here at the speed of light, it'd take two and a half million years to get here. So he said, well, I really wanna talk, meet with you at some point. So we kept in our, this relationship and he eventually told me that when he was doing this work for McDonnell Douglas in the 60s, that um, he was uh, put on the Condon Committee because they thought, because he was a very prestigious uh, aerospace guy at a major aerospace company, um, that he would be, uh, go along with the debunking whitewash of the Condon Committee. And Dr. Wood um, was someone who started bringing in boatloads of evidence. And it was turning the committee to the fact, no, these are absolutely real. So Professor Condon went to old man McDonald, head of McDonnell Douglas Aerospace, and said, you fire that son of a bitch. So I get him off this committee. And uh, Mr. McDonald said, no, I'm not gonna fire him. He's a very good man. But he was thrown off the Condon Committee. But he didn't lose his job. A McDonald stood by him. And um, that's an that's a absolutely true story. Um, and it came out in this cache of documents from the CIA, my God, in 94, that Professor Condon and that committee, some of the key people, were on the payroll of the CIA. And it's in black and white. It's an uncontested document. University of Colorado Boulder, prestigious um, aerospace guy, and he was carrying water and doing the bidding of the intelligence community, all the time masquerading as an objective scientist. So this is why, you know, I have said, like Seth Shostak and those people who are with SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, they are either the stupidest people in the world or they're on the payroll of somebody to lie to the public. You cannot be that stupid, given the dispositive evidence we put out there. And I actually debated on Voice of America, the head of the SETI project, Seth Shostak and I, and I had my disclosure project witnesses there. We basically cleaned his clock because the evidence is so dispositive and overwhelming if you go through our material archive. But this happens all the time. So if you just extrapolate that goes couple of examples throughout professorial class and scientific class. It's how it's done. Now in some cases it's done not for payment so much as to protect your own reputation. For example, there was a guy named Carl Sagan. Everybody heard, know who he is? Anyway. Cosmos series and all that. Um, he actually was on the payroll of the intelligence community. And what happened is that uh, Carl Sagan there were some improprieties in his PhD thesis, which led to the intelligence community reaching out to him. And they basically said, you're gonna tell the public what we're gonna tell you to tell the public, or you're gonna be washing the floors at Cornell. You're not gonna be a professor. And a good friend of his, two of his friends, uh, George Fennell, who co-founded the Extrasolar Planetary Society and founded the Allegheny Observatory outside Pittsburgh, who's on my team, James Mullaney, who is a very eminent astronomer who was the editor of Sky uh, uh, Telescope magazine and Astronomy magazine, confirmed to me that this happened to Carl Sagan. And, 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 and they, one of them told me that he basically he aged 30 years and a month because he had to sell his, sell his soul to the devil. And so he went from someone looking into UFOs and actually said some positive things about their reality to being a chief debunker of them. Um, and that was a real tragedy because they had what's called oppo research, opposition research, like a political party had, they had dirt on him. Um, and they used it to turn him. But to the public, 
you know, he was this renowned, respected scientific figure. So just magnify that all through society. That's how it operates. Um, and I know it's not a very pretty picture, it's a little cynical, it's not cynical, it's just a reality. People need to, it's childhood's end here today. Wake up, this is how the world actually works. It's, it's bare knuckle time. And that's one of the big problems is that it, the same thing happens in the media. Everyone thinks we have a free press. We don't have a free press. We, we have a free press about things like the stain on the blue dress or something like that. Um, or other, you know, Kardashian's wardrobe. Um, but on anything really critical like this, we do not have a free press. Um, and I can give you many, many, many examples. I'll only give you a couple. And this involves both the mainstream news media and another one that involves Hollywood. Take this and extrapolate it. Ira Rosen, won his Emmy working with Mike Wallace at ABC News. He then became the executive producer, ABC News New York for Primetime Live in 2020. When we started moving forward with the Disclosure Project, he came out to my farm in Virginia and came out with a production team. I gave him 35 hours of top secret testimony and countless top secret documents. And he says, either this is the biggest hoax in the world or the biggest story in human history. And he says, I think it's the latter. I said, it is. He says, we're gonna do a series of town hall meetings with your witnesses and we're gonna do a huge expose on this. I said, I don't think ABC will let you. And he said, I'm the executive producer and I have final decision over this. I said, Ira, I don't think they'll let you, but I'll cooperate here. You know, here's 20 years of research and all this effort. You can have it on a silver platter, don't, I'm, no payment. I'm not a consultant, I give everything away for free. So he's, he goes back to New York, he takes me up there. You know, there's Diane Sawyer and all these guys. Well, you know, it was interesting. I said, well, if you can make this happen, it's awesome. So a couple weeks later, he calls me up rather sheepishly. And he says, Dr. Greer, they're not gonna let me do this story. And I said, well, Ira, I thought you said you had total control over programming for primetime life. He says, Dr. Greer, not for this. And I said, well, who are they? He says, Dr. Greer, you know who they are. And that was the end of it. And we've stayed in touch. She's now back with the 60 Minutes. But that was one of the reasons why many of you may remember that Mike Wallace went on Larry King Live and, taught, and had, a, had had a deep depressive breakdown and he talked about, the, he kept saying, I was a fraud, I'm a fraud. And part of it is that a guy named Schwartz, who was on the board of Time Life, and I met, and he was very good friends with Mike Wallace, and he, Mike Wallace had gotten a hold of a cache of these documents. And I was in New York at a party, and this, the, you know, Bob Schwartz said to me, he says, look, he said, uh, the media has become the scribe taking dictation from the right hand of the king and particularly on something like this. And so Mike Wallace, who was this esteemed investigative reporter, couldn't touch the biggest investigative reporting story in history. And he felt like a total fraud and went into a deep depression over it. Um, if you take Hollywood, the same thing happens. The only movies you really can see that come out anymore, now Close Encounters of the Third Kind by Spielberg was a docudrama. He was given access to some of the secret files at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, that's true. Um, if you haven't seen that movie, go see it, it's classic. But in the modern times, that was in the 70s, I think, um, it just isn't possible. The studios are completely mobbed up with people, just like these scientists who actually are on the payroll, with people that respond to the intelligence community. So Arnold Copelson was a huge producer, had multi-billion dollar in, in uh, uh, gross sales for his movies, flew me out to LA. He uh, wanted to do an enormous expose, true life story, be like Argo, um, but based on my work and what I've done. Uh, it'd be a thriller, because you, know, you have murder, you have mayhem, you have intrigue, you have ET contact, you have the whole thing, he loved it. And he was there and I was at you know, 20th Century Fox and he had a $60 million discretionary budget to do any movie he wanted, pre-approved, because he was a big name. And I said, well, Arnold, I don't think they're gonna let you do this one. 
He says, oh, yes, I'm Arnold Copelson, and I've done this, and I, he took me to his vanity wall of all his awards. I said, great, wonderful, give me a call. So he sends one of his chief assistants here to D.C. when we're doing the private closed briefings for members of Congress in April of 1997. And um, she goes back, and, and, and he, go, he goes, he said, this is the most incredible bunch of information because we filmed all that. And so I let him have that closed briefing film. He says, this is gonna be the biggest movie. It'll be bigger than E.T. or Close Encounters or any of them. And certainly it'd be bigger than something like Avatar. I said, well, good, do it. So, but I don't know if they'll let you. He says, why do you say that? I said, well, let's see. Let's put it, put it in, start it, start it down the path and let's see what happens. A few weeks later, I get a call from Arnold Copelson. He says, Dr. Greer, they won't let me do this movie. I said, oh, Arnold, I thought you had the $60 million already in the bank ready to roll. He says, not for this. Fox has killed it. Put it in turnaround faster than, faster than 10 light years of light speed. So it went into turnaround and got killed. And turnaround means when you take a film and basically kill it. So that's what happened. And it's happened. I give you this example. If I'd be here until tomorrow morning giving you examples I've had with the media, the mainstream media, where this has happened over and over and over again. So one of the problems is the big media do not allow certain things to be exposed. And we have been brainwashed to think that we're the land of the free and have a free press and a free market, et cetera. But we do only within a certain confine. But ironically, that confine is a prison. Because how do you have a free market if the most important technologies and information of the last hundred years is sequestered and can't be used. I mean, that's not a free market. That's a managed market and controlled, and it is. Same thing with the media. So that's really how that works. And you need to understand that's a very important component of how magic uh, infiltrates and operates. And, and, if, and uh, keep that in mind whenever you start seeing a major media report. And um, now with the internet, we can put something out and it can reach Ironically, we can put vid a video out and it'll have five million views and it'll reach more people than Larry King Live used to or most of the CNN talk show hosts get. So uh, luckily we're able to bypass it now, but back in the good old days. But even then it's sort of relegated the mainstream. The thing that people respect for their source of news, CBS News, ABC News, CNN, et cetera, and so on, won't touch this in a credible way. And if they start to, and believe me, there have been many initiatives from the Wall Street Journal approached me, wanted to do a huge story, gets killed, gets killed, gets killed. So there are operatives that are embedded in the corporate, the integrated corporations of all of these media holding companies. And it will not make it out. And that has been my experience to date. I'd be, love to be surprised. Now, that then brings into the question of what about the rest of the sectors, and, you know, and someone at the, uh, the break brought up this question of funding. Because I mentioned towards the end, well, there's eight and a half trillion now that's unaccounted for. Trillion, not billion, trillion. A trillion is a thousand billion. So in other words, it's a lot of money. <laughs> and unfortunately, it isn't as obvious as it seems. And this is where, you know, take the children out of the room Here's how this actually works. So you have, I mentioned, the sort of storefront with the military industrial unacknowledged special access projects. And that's, you can kind of steal uh, actually uh, several billion dollars very easily that way. And each year I estimate out of the treasury of the United States through these operations, it's between 100 and 200 trillion do billion dollars. N not you know, a huge amount, but if you look at the military, intelligence, homeland security, FBI, and there are other people, there was a, a undersecretary for HUD for Bush, uh, George H.W. Bush, who discovered that HUD money, housing and urban development money, was being, was being siphoned off into these black projects. And she started to blow the whistle on it, she got fired. So. One of the things you have to begin to get your mind around is how the, the unacknowledged special access projects can penetrate not just the intelligence and military, but other agencies and then 
siphon off funds. And it, you, know, you get a trickle here and trickle and it becomes this huge river. Now there's another second and very important way that funding happens. Um, and that is through monetizing products. Now what do I mean by that? Let's say that you're Bell Labs back in the old days or um, some of these other large corporations and you're studying under US funding contracts in these unacknowledged projects a technology and you figure out, oh, this is really what you can do with an integrated circuit and miniaturize it. Or this is what you can, this, these things we collected off the desert floor in 47 were these little fibrous things that you put a light at one end, boom, it's perfectly transmitted to the other, fiber optics. So you then create a market for it and, and you allow some of this out, but there's a huge amount of money made on productizing fiber optics, integrated circuits, miniaturization, microprocessors, things of this sort. So there are spinoffs, and those spinoffs make an enormous amount of money for those companies. Even though we, the taxpayers, paid for the R&D, and those folks really didn't invent it, <laughs> but they benefit from it, from the corporate level. So that enriches the corporation so that it can then self-fund through licensing and productization things that were actually funded by the taxpayer. Now, big farm, the pharmaceutical industry does this all the time. They take stuff that's being funded at NIH or through university grants, the breakthroughs happen in basic science, they then take it one step further, patent it, license it, and next thing you know, a course of chemotherapy costs you $250,000. That's how it works, like rituximab. So, but that, that's been done with these high-tech programs since the 40s and 50s. So that's a huge source. So then they have their own funding. But now you can see how they can lift off the reservation away from government even more because they're more independent, corporate. Then there's the banking sector, and this is the big one. <laughs> you know the Federal Reserve Board basically just invents money out of thin air when <laughs> we had the financial crisis a few years ago. Uh, in the mainstream Wall Street Journal, you know, it was admitted they basically injected $17 trillion into the banking sector. Trillion. TARP was a small part of this. $800 billion, not much. This is $17 trillion. They basically at no interest gave $17 trillion to the gang banksters, I call them. They are gang banksters. And those guys who have integrated, if you look at the corporate nexus, between the banking and financial sector and these large corporations and these government agencies, there is a nexus that gets woven. And the real power is really in the financial macroeconomic level. And they basically can fund whatever and whoever they want and can move money around virtually with impunity. They're too big to fail. And at this point, I mean, there's a joke that if you think they're being regulated, this is a joke. So, the, the gang banksters have learned how to use that system and they have investments and interest and in startups, you know, whether it's the, the Blackstone Group or the Carlisle Group and this, you know, private banking at J.P. Morgan Chase and what this and that and the other thing. And so there's this whole labyrinthine system that involves the banking sector. And then there are covert parts of the banking sector. I'll tell you a story of a man who, um, back when I was working on this and they made another run after I said no to the head of army intelligence when they wanted to buy my silence with $2 billion in slush fund money. I was taken to the Wrigley Mansion in uh, Phoenix one night, and it was a late night meeting, maybe 10, 11 o'clock, and there was a whole group of people. It was a, like a conference for boardroom in this mansion and around the table were a whole bunch of suits. And most of them were corporate, a couple government. And they say basically to me, you know, they said, you don't need to bother with someone like the president or the CIA director. They don't know anything and they're not going to know anything. You need to be meeting with people like, well, us, who do WFO 
work for other programs for the government. And there are certain orders of Jesuit priests who are involved with technology transfer policy. I said, what? I thought they, got, they, they were on drugs. And it turned out every word they said was true, and I was just listening. Um, it'd be an interesting movie, wouldn't it? Anyone has the cojones to do it. Then they started, this one guy pulled me aside, and he said, you know, we've checked you out. You're a doctor. You have good credit, good income. Take out as many platinum cards as you want. Give them to me. We will then zero out the, the account balances every month. So you can spend several million dollars a month and we'll just zero it out. Now you put me under sodium penalty. This actually happened. And I said, well, then you would own me, wouldn't you, Jim? He says, oh, don't look at it that way. We're here trying to help you. I said, no, you would own me. This is f fraud, banking fraud. And he says, no, well, you know, just look at it as a friendly hand helping you out. I mean, it's friendly, you know devil with forked tongue. And, uh, and then he started to explain. He says, you know, there are a lot of creative ways where we can get money when we need to. And it, this guy headed up some folks who do the backup computers for the banking system. And these are big supercomputers. And basically, when you have trillions of dollars daily going back and forth in currency exchange and transactions, there's an odd amount left over that's less than a penny or less than a euro or less than a yen. That gets dropped into a black fund account. And it's a lot of money. It adds up on a daily. If you take 365 days in a year, you've got a lot of money from that. It can, becomes billions, tens of billions. So you have the black budget, unacknowledged projects. You have the corruption and fraud within the government system. You have the productization, monetization of things that we're paying for the study that they then monetize, like integrated circuits and cell phones and fiber optics. Then you have the banking corruption. And then you have the pièce de résistance. And the one that is the most disturbing, and that's drug trade. So the worldwide drug trade is cash, cash and carry, bigger than oil. And when I first heard this from an attorney who was representing a man's family whose husband, a Marine colonel, was murdered because he saw them offloading um, drugs at a military base in um, California, I thought this was a bridge too far. I did not actually believe it. Um, and this attorney, a very, very credible guy, Harvard Law, was representing the family to get them to um, exhume the body because the body was, uh, the death was deemed a suicide. And the family knew the man had been murdered because of what he saw, because he had told one family member what he saw. And he was at the wrong place at the wrong time in a restricted landing area, in a restricted facility, where one of our aircraft was offloading a large amount of drugs that would then be sent out through various drug cartels and whatnot. And they killed him because of what he saw, made it look like a suicide. And I filed that away as data point one. <clears throat> then I had another data point come in of a woman who owned a 5,000 acre sheep ranch <laughs> in South Dakota, of all places, but adjacent to it was what had been a chemical weapons storage area and an underground facility. And she had enough resources that she had her own people go out with night scopes and found that there were uh, ARVs, so-called alien reproduction, these man-made anti-gravity things going in and out of this facility, wee hours of the morning. And then he, she got someone close enough who saw that they were offloading huge amounts of chemical weapons, armaments, and drugs. So arms sh shipping as well as drug shipping. She contacted Senator Daschle, the senior senator of, of South Dakota, who started digging into it. He got threatened personally. I have a whole dossier file on this in my vault. And he backed off of it. He ran from it light year. He had the speed of light. 
to get away from it because they made it very clear, stay away from this. Senator Daschle, he, he said, I can't help you anymore. So she reached out to me saying, can you help me? Because part of what was happening is that some of these chemical weapons that were stored there were leaking into um, not only the, the groundwater but it, and were her sheep and a lot of them were dying. And it was like these containers that were corroding. It was like a, a super fun site, but classified. It was a disaster. And that's why she was so concerned. She had, and she had a whole, I mean, she had 5,000 acres. And I said, look, you know, I'm, I can, I'll make some calls and see what I can do. But I, I, you know, I've got a heavy lift here I'm doing on my own besides your sheep. But, um, but this is a very real case. Then on the day after I met with and briefed the head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I got a cryptic invitation from two men. My wife and I call them Mr. Allen One and Mr. Allen Two. So not their name, it was our code name. Um, I, I, I don't wanna talk about who they actually are until they're deceased. I can confirm they're deceased. And um, they invited me over to this condo in Crystal City near National Airport which turned out was the home of a former congressman who was sort of a consigliere and, and sort of advisor to George H.W. Bush. And in the room with him was a burly man who was a Science Applications International Corporation executive who was living virtually in retirement exile in France who had come in for the meeting. And it, it was shocking what I learned, uh, but in, not so shocking given what I've just told you. But they said, do you understand how dangerous this group is? I said, yes, I do, <laughs> personally. And they said, but do you understand what they're really doing? They're destroying our world, they're destroying our planet, and they're destroying our country. And these are the ones that have gotten off the reservation even from George H.W. Bush and have escaped control, gangland style. I said, yeah, I, I know that there are special compartmented operations that are unacknowledged that aren't even under the control of MAGIC anymore, M-A-J-I-C. They said, yes, there's a big one, and it deals with drugs. He says, there is an army of 8,000 men that are special operations folks, and he's, they said that they, do, they move drugs all over the world and the country, and we have killed 2,000 of them, murdered them, thrown them out of helicopters, missing in action because of minor infractions in security or a hint that there might be, 2,000 of the 8,000. 8, and they began to describe this program in detail, and I listened. And they said, you know, so this is part of the problem you're dealing with. And by the way, to connect the dots, this is why we don't have legalization or decriminalization of drugs, which in every health policy person knows you can buy anything on the streets of any little town in America. It needs to be, you know, I mean, it needs to be something where there's treatment, education, and what have you, but if it was made legal, you would take away an enormous part of the funding for this criminal cartel. And it is the biggest criminal enterprise in the world. So uh, one of my attorneys said, you know, what you're really describing is a transnational RICO racketeering influence corrupt organization? I said, yes, of course. He says, well, you know, civilians can mount outside of the government a proceeding against using the RICO statutes, that basically, which was set up for the mafia. I said, yeah, if you know an attorney that has the courage to do it, let me know. And this gets into something else that could be done. And with the information that we have and the people that could be um, asked about. And that is a major investigation with a whistleblower act result. What do I mean by that? The Federal Whistleblower Act allows for someone to blow the whistle on illegal and corrupt activity and what is recovered or exposed through that whistleblower, the whistleblower gets a percentage of. In this case, we'd be talking about billions of dollars. So if there's a legal team that wants to head this up and some more whistleblowers that we can put together, that's how you could fund the energy lab, 
but it would be a very big lawsuit and project. It can be done if there's anyone who has the wherewithal to do it. I've mentioned this to a few attorneys and then when they find out who you're really taking on, they go, no thanks, no thanks, no thanks. So it's all about courage. You have the courage to take on this sort of uh, fourth Reich that's really running these projects, this, this uh, neo-fascist transnational security state. Um, but that is another big part of the funding mechanism. And there are others, but these are the big pillars of how you get funding for an unacknowledged special access project. Um, it isn't nice and it isn't pretty, and then it ends up doing things that are completely out of the control. If we go to the next document from Prince Hans Adam von Lichtenstein, this is gonna get heavier and darker for a little bit until it gets better, just bear with me. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you know who this is. Liechtenstein is a big banking empire. And kind of they funded a lot of Adolf Hitler's work. And um, uh, the crown prince is their king. So this is a man that I've met with and um, known for a number of years. I think this is dated 1994. Um, and Hans Adam von Liechtenstein, um, the first time I called, the, I was asked to call the, the castle, uh, his butler or someone picked up and then he was immediately put on and we talked and he says, well, I don't want to talk on the phone too much, but we should meet. And these letters, this and the, you can go to the next one also. Um, uh, it was a, maybe a, a few, few, a month later or something. Um, it was from the castle, Vaduz, um, and this is the actual letters. Um, he's, and he, he basically said to me, you know, let's get together. And I think he, I, he was wanting me to come to Europe. And I said, well, I'm too busy. I'm working as a doctor. And, um, and then it, it ended up, and although it's not reflected in this letter, he came to New York and stayed at the Four Seasons um, Hotel there in uh, Central Park. And um, so he invited me over and I had a meeting with him. But he says, from what I know of your assessment, your assessment is correct about the group, this cabal which is controlling the issue we discussed, the UFO. I suspect they have very good reasons not to inform the public, and therefore I am highly skeptical about your chances of success. But he still wanted to meet. So <laughs> I said, okay, let's meet. So this is where it's gonna get into some shock and awe. I'm going 94 in July. I go up and meet with him at the Pierre Hotel, Four Seasons, and the reason he didn't think it could succeed is that he told me the ETs wouldn't allow it. He wouldn't allow, they wouldn't allow disclosure to happen. I said, excuse me, we're making contact and it's clear that, you know. Um, he said, well, let me tell you what happened. So he was involved with a lot of UN programs and also with uh, George H.W. Bush, the first President Bush and a man at the UN named Perez de Cuellar, who was the Secretary General at the time. I had done briefings with uh, the predecessor, the, um, uh, with the one after Boutrous Boutrous Ghali. And he said to me, the reason I on the phone told you that it wouldn't be allowed, isn't that it wouldn't be allowed from the point of view of the government, but the aliens won't allow it. I said, well, that's ridiculous. I mean, since we've been talking, we've gone down to Mexico, had craft come out. I said, they're obviously wanting to make contact if we do it in a peaceful way and not a military way. He says, well, this was attempted before you started your organization. I said, what are you talking about? He says, well, in November of 1989, in the fall of 1989, President Ronald Reagan, Mikhail Gorbachev, Perez de Cuellar, and himself, this guy and others met with on a committee, very sensitive and classified, to organize basically what I did with the disclosure project, to announce that we weren't alone and end the secrecy. And he said what happened is that Perez de Cuellar, the Secretary General of the United Nations, was coming back from a 3 a.m. late nine pl planning session for this event. When he was abducted, by aliens from his motorcade in Manhattan. And I said, oh really? And he proceeded to tell me the gory details of what happened. So Perez de Cuellar was taken somehow out of the motorcade 
onto an ET craft where he was threatened by the ETs and told, if you disclose this information, we will abduct every world leader involved, including the President of the United States. Now this is from a person who was at the table for this planning session. To my ears, now to you. And I went, oh, come on, really? And he said, yeah, it blew up like an atomic bomb in the Bush White House. Subsequently, I found out that up at Kennedy Bunkport, there were all these UFOs zipping around when uh, Bush was up there out on his cigarette boat. And they didn't realize they were ours. So now we're getting into false flag 101, up to and including being able to deceive members of magic. And it took me a long time to get to the bottom of this mystery. Now, people like Bud Hopkins thought it was a real abduction case. And I looked into it, and I found out that if you go back to the Roswell event, there was a red-headed sergeant who was the badass guy who threatened to kill everyone, all those ranchers who saw this thing crash. His son became a part of magic security, this renegade group, this splinter group, who was involved with abductions and stopping leaks within magic itself. They, he then went and was in the security detail that night and set up the electronics for this electronic warfare abduction of aliens. It was all a hoax was an ET at all, it was 100% military ops. And so when, we're gonna get into this in a moment, well, how these operate. And so Paris de Cuellar, of course, not knowing about that end of the classified world, and I would say Papa Bush neither, thought it was actually ET. And it blew up, as I said, like an atomic bomb in the Bush White House, and Gorbachev, they pulled the plug on the plans to do disclosure and in secrecy in 1989 at the end of the Cold War. And I think it's strange that in January of 90, two months later, it's when I had a contact event at my house in North Carolina with an ET and with a, that said basically, pick up what you've dropped, do this, what you, what you left and behind as a teenager, pick this up again, someone's gotta pick this up. But Maybe that's a coincidence, but Perez de Cuellar thought that that was an actual alien abduction. And I had that, I said, well, with your highness, with all due respect, there are technologies that would facilitate this kind of deception. And the military term, so you know it, is a false INW, or a deceptive INW, indication and warning. And it's basically like the you know, Gulf of Tonkin event in Vietnam, you basically exaggerate or hoax an event that then man manipulates policymakers. So this was the ultimate takedown of official disclosure, which was about to happen in 1989. Got it? 26 years ago, November 1989. So here we are in 2015 and it took a lot to piece all this together and I began to, to, to look into what the electronics were uh, with this and all what kind of technologies they might have. And uh, one bit of insight that print, the Prince had, he said, you know, so he told me that the reason he was funding the abduction groups is that he was convinced that there was an existential threat from outer space that's been the sub rosa planned since the 56, and that he wanted people to hate the aliens enough to pay the blood and treasure of World War III. And he also wanted it to be eschatological, where it would result in the end of the world so that Christ would return and the good folks would go up in a flying saucer, I guess, with Christ. Now, this is what he was telling me. I'm just listening, and I'm going, whoa, this is like, woo-hoo. Um, and he was completely convinced that this is what needed to happen, this sort of end of the world eschatological, eschatology is the study of the end of the world, 
event, and that's why he was putting so much money in and providing so much funding to uh, Mac and David Jacobs and you know Bud Hopkins and all this. And he eventually he told me he says I'm going to stop funding John Mac because he's become too positive about contact, and I, I only want to fund people who are going to put things out there that scare people and make them hate the aliens. He said this, so I went oh boy. Now this, this is connecting a dot that all of you better listen to very carefully if it's the last thing you learn today. And that is that there is an overarching agenda that was hatched in the 50s. Remember that psychological warfare document and its value? That was hatched in 50, between 53 and 56 to create the specter of a threat from outer space that does not exist. Werner von Braun stated on his deathbed, and we have the testimony of his assistant, that he, and, and, and said, they will first have the Cold War, then we decided there would be nations of concern, then global terrorism. We have this testimony from before 9-11. Then that would be followed by threats from outer space. They'll start talking about asteroids and things of this sort, but the ultimate one they're gonna play is the alien threat and it's all a lie and it's all a hoax. But in order for the lie to work, they have had to create a body of disinformation, false information and frightening scenarios and actual events that would be convincing to our policymakers like Reagan, convincing to the average person and to the UFO public that consumes videos entertainment consoles, movies, et cetera. And that has been the 50 to 60 year plan. Don't forget that no less a figure than Douglas MacArthur in his last address to the Congress said World War III will be interplanetary. So they have been wanting to provoke an interplanetary conflict for as long as I've been alive and I'm no spring chicken. And all right, so this gets into a huge problem of how people consume information and can be manipulated through fear. Because if you look at the roots of human uh, warfare, the early days and even today, it's people abducting people, a tribe's women, raping them, abusing them sexually, et cetera, and so on. This is all stuff that they are simulating and saying that the ETs are doing through these abduction scenarios. It is 100% being done by military special operations that are this paramilitary force. Um, and this is the deep end of the pond. Now, when I discovered this back in 1994, now this is 21 years on, I was told by someone in the intelligence community, don't talk about that because that's what's really dangerous for you. And it's also what will discredit you and it will also cause them to hate you the most because you're defanging their whole war plan. The next big war is not terrorism, it's interstellar. And if you expose that it's a hoax, it takes all the steam out of their plan. I said yes, but if we don't, we're cooked because there's no way you can have war that's interstellar and survive it. It'd be worse than mutual assured destruction because the technologies are a you know, thousand times worse than a hydrogen bomb. So I said, look, we're gonna have to figure out how to deal with this. And it, the only way I know how to do it is put the sunlight in there and let people know what the truth is. So a man came along, if we go to the next slide, um, And you probably have seen this, it's up on our website. Uh, when we first put it up, it had over 600,000 views. The next day, uh, the intelligence community went in and said there were 6,000 views. By the way, if you believe the metrics on Google and YouTube, I have a bridge to sell you. It's, it's all can be manipulated because it moves you down the search engines. So when this hit, within a couple of days, had 600,000 views. This man, William Pollock, his name is pronounced Pollock, uh, it was a man, very good man, who gave me an interview only to be released posthumously after he died. And not long, a few years ago, I got a letter from his wife 
significant other, I guess, they weren't technically married, uh, and with a, a death certificate and a letter giving me permission, and he had, passed, he had passed away. And I have a lot of these, you know, and I honor my word about keeping a confidence. So what happened is that he gave me this interview, and in it, he talks about the development of RF radio frequency chip implants back in the 70s and 80s. And this, it, when he was developed, it was, it was totally an accidental thing that happened. He was with a company that developed it. it he then got called into the CIA, and they started doing special programs for the CIA to develop it. And at a certain point, Siemens in Silicon Valley manufactured two billion of them, with a B, of these RF chips. And the way they work, I mean, they can be so miniaturized, you could eat something with it, it has a radio free, and it can transmit not only where you are, but the really advanced ones have a neurophone capability to control thought and behavior. Very sinister stuff. Um, so you can actually do a lot of psychological warfare with these RF frequency chips. Uh, now that was the early stages in the 70s and 80s. Now you figure, you know, 40 years later, they're more and more and more and more sophisticated. And as I've watched the whole UFO subculture sort of get involved with this whole fascination with abductions and, and implants, I went, yeah, but you know EG and G? Is on the, one of the plants is on the edge of the Area 51. They're the ones manufacturing the implants that you're taking out of these abduction victims. Absolutely. They're not coming from outer space. They don't need that. If you're interstellar, you're transdimensional. If you're transdimensional, you don't need an RF frequency plant chip to track anybody because their technologies are way beyond that. I said, this is human, 100%. And you better wake up. And so Powlett gave us this interview, and it was one of a dozen data points that I began to accumulate. And then, not many years ago, I get a document, the next one, which is chilling. It's never been shown. It's from the Strategic Studies Institute, think tank, and it's dated 1995. And it was talking about all kinds of global security strategies. And you know, you can look at it yourself, cult programmed graduates, blah, 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 who will be expected to participate in contrived UFO abduction scenarios. Listen carefully. Oh, we need the next one up. Um, Strategic Studies Institute. Is it, I can't see the screen, is it up? All right. So I loathe reading to people because, but this, I will. <laughs> and number two, create a global UFO cult which will involve, this, this is what needs to be done in order to actuate this false flag operation, that will involve the abduction of citizens so as to foster an illusion that this Earth is facing an extraterrestrial invasion. UFO abductees of preference will have an experience in computer technologies since that expertise will be required in future technocratic RMA scenarios. Use of experimental drugs, holographic projection capabilities, directed energy technologies, I'll get into that in a moment, induced auditory input. These are the neurophones I mentioned that Werner von Braun said the most dangerous thing is the neurophone non-local things that can be done to, to make people think they're having an experience when they're not. Um, input, experimental aircraft, well, that's just a euphemism for man-made UFOs, and special effects costuming and stagecraft, among other things, will be used to persuade the abductees of the reality of their circumstances. Official denials regarding these events will employ reverse psychology to ensure that all such denials are taken as official confirmation of an imminent and or ongoing extraterrestrial invasion. This is the next page. UFO abductees will be persuaded to worship their anticipated ET conquerors in cult-enforced religious fashion. UFO cult networks will be controlled by U.S. intelligence to limit infiltration and ensure that dissidents do not disrupt 
UFO long-term long agendas. Uncontrollable dissidents will be assassinated, preferably by directed energy means. Dissociative satanic cult graduates will handle all such executions, i.e. when not actively lending logical and theatrical support to UFO abduction operations. Number three, directed energy surveillance and weapons technology of all types and caps will be used for purposes of spreading fear and confusion in the population at large under deniable circumstances for eliminating persons deemed adversarial to U.S. national security interests and for spotting, assessing, and manipulating potential re recruits to the RMA cause. Neurocybernetics and other psychotechnologies will be used to sow so confusion and hypochondria in the population. The symptoms and effects produced by these and other directed energy technologies will parallel the effects produced by various microbes, viruses, and chemical imbalances, thus compelling a large segment of society to seek medical intervention, which in turn will be a basis for their being used for medical experimentation under voluntary circumstances. Psychiatrists and psychologists will play an important role in these experiments, particularly where denying the efficacy of neuro-cybernetics psychotechnologies is concerned. Com <laughs> Citizens who complain of hearing voices will be used as a basis for generously government-funded schizophrenic-related brain research, on and on and on. It goes on. Now, if you're not falling out of your chair yet, what I want to tell you is that all of that has come to pass and came to pass between the 1950s and the 1970s. A man that I worked with before his death had developed a, an electronic system in 1956 or 54, 54, that would enable someone electronically to remote view anywhere and could also affect, uh, these, some of these have been called radionic psychotronic weapon systems. And they were developed decades ago. Now, how hard is it to deploy them? Not hard. And they're not used every day. They're used enough to create a groundswell of conviction that there's an alien threat. So you take that capability, combine it with man-made UFOs, combine it with disinformation in general about the subject and also certain chemicals, and you can launch an entire contagion of fear that's based on completely man-made false events. So this is the false flag event I wanted to warn you about. It, and people say, when is that going to happen? I said, it's happened already. It's already happened. The media, the film industry, any UFO conference you go to is going to be filled unwittingly usually, not always unwittingly, but usually with information that is this kind of disinformation designed to create an us versus them dynamic of an alien threat. And the reason for it is that that is the only way to grow the military industrial complex. You know, Leon Panetta, the CIA director and then Secretary of Defense, but when he was CIA director, said, you know, we're spending a $110 billion a year chasing down 70 Al-Qaeda members in Afghanistan. Ridiculous. Um, and in order to sustain the level of expenditures and grow the military, industrial, intelligence, laboratory, financial complex, you got to have another enemy. And as terrible as the terrorism threat is, and it's real, it's nothing compared to what they could do like in the movie Independence Day, where they stage an attack using man-made anti-grabs that look very ET with this kind of technology that there is a threat or an attack on Earth. So heads up. Werner von Braun on his deathbed warned that this would happen and it would be hoaxed. We've had so many people, I have met with one man, I can't get him to come forward, and then another, and then another, and then another, who spoke of, in the early days they used, I know this sounds terrible, but he was a little guy, and it was a little, he was so short, and they basically did like you would in a movie, suit and head and mat to make him look like an alien. And he would be, there would be military choppers nearby, but he would be on one of these 
flying disks, man-made, and go in and with a chemical canister and some electronics, abduct people. And he says, oh yeah, I was on an abduction squad, it was way back, I think in the 60s. They've gotten better, and I say better, and they've become more efficient because over the decades they've developed little creatures that look like an ET. They may look gray or like a reptile or this, and they actually, they kind of walk like this. They have this robotic weird walk, and if, if you look at the, uh, I saw the video that Stan Romanek had of the one that came into his house that, that basically a film company bought up in Black Shell. Nobody has seen this. I was at his home. And the one that came into his house was exactly one of these so-called gray-like creatures. And the way it moved was this very robotic, it was so obvious that it was a bio-machine. And if you go into the brain, it, it is physical. It has a biological component, but the, it's laced, the, the neural cortex is laced with integrated circuits. And it's completely under control of these military operatives. But he thought it was an alien. I said, well, it was an alien, but not an ET. So I use the word alien, which is, has a very xenophobic ring, to connote the man-made ones, and the ETs are the ones that are interstellar. The aliens that are man-made are ones that are completely under the control of these paramilitary operations. And the stagecraft, if you use the language of this Strategic Studies Institute document, is so good that it would fool anyone. The president, the CIA, you could abduct, and they did. They abducted Paris de Cuellar out of his limousine using this stuff, and he thought it was E.T. And that's why they killed the initial plan to end secrecy at the end of the Cold War. Gorbachev was on board, Reagan was on board, Paris de Cuellar, head of the UN, Prince of Liechtenstein was involved, et cetera, and so on. Killed it. Now, now we're getting, now this I know is where everyone's going, can this man have lost his mind? I, every word I'm telling you is true. This is the heart of the secrecy. How do you convince people there's another species to hate? Now they actually took this from the playbook of Adolf Hitler. The way they conditioned the population. How'd you get, how'd you get a very, I mean, in the 20s, in the early part of the 20th century, Germany was the apex of culture, erudition, progressivity, uh, intellectual pursuits, et cetera, and so on. How do you get that population to devolve into this horrific community that could engage in the Holocaust and, and, and World War II, the way that happened? psychological warfare. So the psychological warfare masters that were involved with the German attempt at Nazism got pulled into the OSS, fence that became the CIA, and they reside today within this unacknowledged transnational, deep national security state. So that's exactly the problem we're facing. It isn't pretty. Yeah, I've tried to summarize it in these three or four hours as best as I can, but it's the truth. Now, as Gloria Steinem said, the truth will set you free, but first it might piss you off. And I think, you know, a lot of people, when they learn that this is what they've been involved with, uh, people who've done research on this subject, get quite irritated because they begin to realize that almost everything you know about this subject is not true about why they're here. Now what I've learned is being head of the CE5, global CE5 effort. Um, oh, let's go to the next one. It's a very interesting uh, thing that came out uh, not long ago. Uh, it, it's from the Daily Mail in, in the UK. But it was an article about this, uh, this new electronic warfare system. And I actually talked about this 20 some years ago. But they're just now bringing it out. And, and it's a, it's a, uh, it's kind of almost like Star Trek, but it's a, something you can put up that basically knocks out all electronic communication. Um, oh, the next, you have the next one? And uh, it's a, it, it just gives you the idea that if this is being reported in, in the regular media, or even tabloid media, this is at least 30 to 40 years old, this. And it's basically a platform that can float over an area and knock out all electronics. 
not only in a city, but over a battlefield or what have you, using pulsed microwaves. Now, this is not talking about scalar. This is pulsed microwaves. But when you pulse microwaves in a certain way, it can cross over into this longitudinal effect, and it can have an enormously destructive um, result. And this was actually getting reported. So if this is being acknowledged in the media, it means that it's at least five, six, seven generations old. So in other words, this is not state of the art. Anything that's acknowledged in the mainstream media is going to be old, old, old technology. Um, and, the, and the really state of the art stuff is highly classified, compartmented, and unacknowledged. Most of the really amazing stuff. So this brings us to how do we get out of this conundrum? And if you see the next, put up the next one. I just want to share this. I shared this in my London presentation last month or in September. And this is the French initiative. And you see the date on it. This is by far, we're about to release all of this with a report on the internet a document ever generated by a government on this subject. Urgent, 16 January 2007. The French government had decided to reach out to us to make peaceful contact with the ETs and bypass this entire unacknowledged world of cloak and dagger nonsense. And so through a series of meetings that happened over three or four years, the, this uh, Dr. Moran and his people, a very senior guy, a admiral and PhD scientist, also a medical doctor, with the Ministry of Defense. This is an official Ministry of Defense letter to me and a few other people about this project. And what they wanted to do was to have the protocols established. And with this document came an entire uh, separate uh, attachment that had all the research and equipment that would be needed uh, to do a friendly diplomatic contact with these civilizations in France. And um, so we cooperated with that. This was something that was not talked about until uh, September. And um, I referred to it some years ago. Those of you may remember, I talked about a major G7 country whose Ministry of Defense was reaching out to us to make peaceful contact. This is it. Um, you know, I'm speaking of it now because that government left, it was Sarkozy, the President Sarkozy, and um, uh, enough time has passed that I feel like I can talk about it with, uh, without too many ruffled feathers. Um, there's still gonna be ruffled feathers with this. But importantly, what you have to look at with this document and, and it's basically an explanation. If you look at the translation, we had expected to do an event sooner and it kept getting delayed. And the delay was because of, as it says, politics. And there were people interfering with this attempt to go out and have a team of folks with the air support, security support, and have, like in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, a contact a landing or a near contact event uh, under the official auspices of the Ministry of Defense of France. Now, when we started going back and forth with this communication, of course, everything I do is monitored in real time. The French ambassador to the United States got a very nasty phone call from our intelligence community and saying, what the hell do you think you're doing? And they really cussed him out. And he said, look, we're doing this, so we're a sovereign country. And basically what was said back to him was, don't do it anywhere near US assets or US airspace or US territory or you'll be in big trouble. And the, the French got very irritated by this. They said, we'll be completely within France and it's none of your business. So obviously there are elements within magic in France who have run interference to interfere with this process. Every major country have elements. And so it's very political, it becomes very, very thorny, but the very fact that senior people in the Ministry of Defense of a major G7 country, group of seven, major economic country, would, and a nuclear power, would reach out to make peaceful contact using the close encounters of the fifth kind initiative is by far the most historic thing. And that's why this document, I think, is the most important document ever written, because it's not classified. 
I only kept it private because I didn't want to burn bridges to the government that was there. And it did involve all the way up to the president of France, this effort. We actually ended up going, I believe it was in 2010 or 2011, and did a CE5 event <clears throat> that actually had enormous results. And um, the, their military had uh, cordoned off the airspace, directed, and we had a 2,200 acre estate in Brittany. Um, and there were ET craft tracked going over uh, head at over 200,000 kilometers an hour and all kinds of strange phenomenon in the field where we were, um, which the admiral was there. Uh, now, no one knew that's who he was. This ended up being a demonstration event for the Ministry of Defense people and not, it was directed by me. And the cover story was that it was a Sea SETI expedition for a weekend. So see, if you sometimes come on these expeditions, there may be other folks there, huh? Get it? Um, nobody knew who he was. He was just a nice gentleman in a plaid shirt. But I mean, that's how these things have to happen. I mean, it wasn't my place to expose who he was. But they were very happy with the results and have learned a lot. And we're continuing to teach them about the concepts of non-locality and consciousness, remote viewing, coherent thought sequencing, electronic interface with thought that the ETs have, how to set up the correct philosophy and conditions for contact, on and on and on. And this is really the core of, of course, why I founded this organization, was to move us away from the brink of war into a time of interplanetary peace and universal peace. But at the same time, we have to understand that an operation like this isn't going on in a vacuum in outer space. It's going on within a world that's enormously dysfunctional, particularly with these national security issues and these uh, sort of spy versus spy groups who interfere. And there was enormous interference between 2007 and 2010 trying to stop that process. Um, and it continues to go on. I mean, there, it turns out there are people who are key involved with the liaison who are actually moles from magic who are there to disrupt events, infiltrators. So this is what happens. I mean, this is welcome to my life. But, um, and it, that should be of no surprise to anyone, and it was certainly no surprise to me. But ultimately, the fact that there would be a major initiative like this from a government like France for peaceful purposes, as opposed to a warfare or militaristic purposes, is a very positive development. Because I had a lucid dream years ago, before I started these projects, and I tend to, I'm part Cherokee and I have a lot of lucid dreams um, of the future, met my wife that way. Um, and we were in the future, um, and we were at White Sands, where the first atomic bomb went off. And there was a beautiful event happening. And the US Air Force and government had moved off this dime of either denial or suppression or hoaxing and trying to create this false flag World War III conflict that's completely a hoax. And had decided, yes, we need to pick this other path and make peaceful contact. And a massive government sanctioned CE5 was happening, broad daylight, and this beautiful silver seamless object descended in a bed of a blue sky, landed, and an ancient elder ET came out of it. And this was all broadcast live, the whole world saw it. Now, you know, maybe, I mean, that was before I founded CSETI and the Disclosure Project and all this. And, and um, I was maybe in my early 20s when I had that dream, and I'm 60 now. So, you know, it, it's, it's a potential future. But I do believe it's a potential future. And the way it's going to become a real future is for all of us to do that. Because guess what? You know who the leaders are on this? You guys. Not the president, not the Congress. Disclosure, contact, all of that first has to be the people. We the people. It's going to happen by us banding together, making contact, being enlightened about what we're doing, not going out there with ray guns but doing it for the purpose of an open relationship that's peaceful and enduring between our planet and these other planets. That is the only possible outcome anyway. The other outcome 
any conflict, I don't care with any ET civilization, would be the complete destruction of their planet and ours. It would be much worse than a, a, a massive global thermonuclear war exchange. So there is no possible future except a peaceful one. So let's figure out how to do that. No matter what your belief systems about these various civilizations that are out there, my own assessment is that some are not really thrilled with us because, well, who wouldn't be? And some are maybe our distant cousins. And some are just getting involved and in looking with some horror at what's happening. But ultimately, none of them are overtly hostile. If they were, it'd be over. And let me tell you, it would have been over the, when we dropped the first atomic bomb. And I've been told that by multiple members of MAGIC, M-A-J-I-C, because they have said, yeah, of course. I mean, any, but it's very easy to play on people's paranoias and fears through mutilations and abductions. And this Dr. John Altshuler I mentioned, who is the nephew of Jimmy Doolittle, General Doolittle, he became the guy who did the first Snippy the Horse case. You know Snippy the Horse, the, the, cat, the cattle mutilation and animal mutilation case? That was him. He didn't get acknowledged because he wanted to stay in the background, but he was the scientist. He, I was staying at his home outside Denver, and he said, absolutely, that case was military. Made to look ET for the purpose of scaring the hell out of people. I said, really? He says, absolutely. And then I met with a man, it was an accidental, you know, the universe works in strange ways. I'm sitting on a flight, uh, flying, uh, I think from Colorado or New Mexico to the East Coast, and I'm, the guy sitting beside me says, oh, I said, well, I'm a doctor. And he says, well, what are you doing out here? I said, well, I actually do stuff with UFOs. He says, oh, you're kidding. He says, let me tell you. And he owned a 250,000 acre ranch in Northern New Mexico. And he said, let me tell you what they're doing to my cattle. And he, and he said, but it's not alien. It's humans, and he, was, he had night scopes. He, put, he was a very wealthy man. And he said, these guys are coming in there with special silent helicopters, and we have them. My military advisor was on a ship where one landed in a fog, and they, were, they couldn't see it. And they said, where is it, where is it? They said, it's, look up, it's right above you, and there's no sound, completely quiet. He says, and we caught them red-handed doing these mutilations on my cattle. And, I, and he instituted a lawsuit against the U.S. government, but the group doing it was an unacknowledged group that's extra-constitutional, and the U.S. government said, we don't know anything about it. And the government people they, who said that were telling them the truth. See, this is real plausible deniability, right? Because they can honestly say, we don't know anything about this. So he took it all the way through the federal court system. It just got thrown out. Even though he had dispositive evidence, human paramilitary and U.S. military assets were doing it. And, uh, you know, I, I've shared this with Linda Mooton Hall and others, you know, an alien harvest. I said, alien baloney. This is being done by people who want to scare the hell out of the public as part of this psychological warfare that was launched in 1953. But there's another reason for it. They're getting raw materials that they do take from that. But it's hard to do it underground. Take them to underground bases, which become culture media for their program life forms. The the man-made ETs I'm talking about. We don't have time to go into what these nanotechnological things are, but let me just say cloning. Dolly the sheep wasn't the first cloned creature. So with the right electromagnetic pulse, it's very easy to clone a human or an ET or take tissue from one, but you need some kind of biological medium. And that's what the, the cattle mutilations provide and the other animal mutilations provide the biological medium for these experiments and the development of man-made fake ETs. And by the way, there was a, an intelligence official who kept calling Stan Romanek, telling him when he had that creature come into his kitchen and said, Stan, it's one of the fake ones. And he didn't know what it meant. I went out there with a MUFON investigator who investigates abductions. I said, yeah, it's a fake one. And he says, what do you mean? I said, I've been talking about this for 20 years. The, the literature is replete with the military invo involvement in these abductions. It's a fake one, it's man-made, it's made to look alien, to scare the hell out of people, but because it puts fear out in the community. I said, it's not extraterrestrial, it's man-made. But the cattle mutilations do two things. They provide a nexus for more fear. Oh my God, not only are they abducting people, they're mutilating. But then it creates a source of biological substrate, material for the 
nano bio machines that are these biologicals that look alien. And that was because they were taking them to Dulce, which was near his ranch. Same thing at Pine Gap. I have a science physicist who worked at Pine Gap in Australia, and it's all subterranean, and he worked on projects. He says, we have these creatures coming off like sausages on a conveyor belt. Absolutely. And I was at a meeting in Australia a couple years ago, and the Minister of Defense for Australia was there. He didn't know anything about this stuff. We had a very interesting conversation. But um, I said, no, you wouldn't. I said, our Secretary of Defense doesn't know about this either. But that is really what's happening. So you have to think that, well, if we can make our way through this nexus of fear and false information that has kind of colonized everyone's mind, then we can go out there with close encounters of the fifth kind teams and make peaceful contact with these civilizations. How beautiful. And that's why I tell people, don't be afraid of anything interstellar. You should be very concerned about paramilitary human. But the interstellars, not a problem. And I think you have to make a distinction. People say, well, how do you tell the difference? Well, an ET craft has no seams. The light from it is coming from refined materials that are so pure that the light itself looks like celestial. The beings themselves have a completely non-invasive, um, very intelligent, I mean, IQ of 400, 500, that range, uh, and very conscious and spiritual. Um, the PLFs, are menacing, they're invasive. The man-made Lockheed Martin, Northrop, SAIC, uh, man-made discs, saucers, triangles, have rivets and seams. Um, it's quite clear to tell the difference, but you need to know there is a difference first, because otherwise you're gonna think everything is alien, and it's not. And that's why I'm doing this webinar with thousands of people watching, it's gonna go up on the, on the web, is that the public needs to know the difference between the real and the false, and what the agenda is for the false one, and how easy it is, whether it's through a cosmic 9-11 or some other scenario, to manipulate the public into fear and get on a war footing where we then suspend our liberties, our freedoms, and spend trillions of dollars and countless lives in a concocted, hoaxed battle. Don't be fooled again. We need to not be fooled again. And this is the big one that we need to be wake up to. If enough of us wake up to this and then go out and make peaceful contact, then those folks who want to see us create a time of endless war can't have their way. They only succeed if you are sheeple who are going to follow along with the conventional wisdom like zombies half asleep. So I beg you to share this with everything, everyone you know. Uh, and go out there and make peaceful contact. The other thing I'm calling for is this whistleblower act provision. If there are people in this audience or who know people who have been involved with these projects who can testify, and if there's an attorney team that will take it, we will initiate this lawsuit. And the next is mass defections. All of you know people who know people who know people. It's two or three degrees of separation. If you work your network, those of you listening who are in California in the high desert, there are people in Palmdale near Edwards, there are people in Nevada listening right now. You network in your community and you find people who are at these facilities that I named, and unfortunately that document didn't make it, but listen to it. And you, I mean, and, if they've worked on these projects related to ETs, UFOs, PLFs, program life forms, anti graph you may defect with impunity under the National Security Act of the United States. Why? Because we have proven today that there are dozens and dozens and dozens of officials in the US government, in the British government, and every other country who have been denied access through a criminal enterprise, a racketeering influence corrupt organization, the largest RICO in the world, that has involved itself in corruption, and therefore it cannot, if it is violating the US, British, and other constitutions, cite the National Security Act to provide cover.
That is why on 2001, on May 9th, when we did the disclosure project, and I had 20 some people at the National Press Club over here, and then subsequently more than 100 that came forward in the book and videos for disclosure, none of them, even though they had top secret clearances on this issue, none of them ever got a phone call or a letter saying, be quiet. Because we had proven between 1992 and 2001 that this is an illegal, unconstitutional operation. So anyone listening who has a family member, a friend, a neighbor, someone you can network who's been in those projects or are currently in those projects, contact me at our website, Sirius Disclosure, S-I-R-I-U-S, disclosure.com. We will treat you with the greatest confidentiality. Now, we do not want to hear from secondhand people unless you have dispositive documents and proof. Only firsthand, people who are there and who can prove they're there. So you'll have a DD-214 from the Department of Defense. You'll have badges from your corporate access. You'll have stuff that can establish it. And that's what we require. But those folks need to come forward in a next wave of disclosure and defect from this criminal enterprise. Many of you, I'm addressing you now, don't know you're in a criminal enterprise because the way compartmented intelligence works, you have a guy at this desk doesn't know what the guy next to him is doing because it's special compartmented intelligence, top secret. And that's the way it works. They're in what are called silos. But I am telling you through these documents and this testimony that the way, this projects, the way these projects are managed, it's illegal. And if it's illegal, they cannot cite you for violating the National Security Act. Now, Snowden disclosed information that the President and Congress did know about. That's different. I'm talking about disclosing information that is not being shared with the President or Congress and are a priori illegal. So the quotidian world of top secret the sort of everyday world of top secret. I'm not talking about that. I'm only talking about unacknowledged special access projects that deal with the anti-gravity or gravity control, new energy, ET, UFO issue. Those things are being managed in a corrupt enterprise that's illegal. So you folks can speak to anyone, provide any materiel, take any document, like some of these that I have that are top secret that have not been declassified, no one's gonna come after you. Now, I did have an FBI gate say to me once, you know, he says, that's a top secret document. If you share that with anyone, each time you share it, it's however many years in prison and whatever zillion dollar fine. I said, really? Come put the bracelets on. I said, because my first call, it was back when I'd been on Larry King, my first call is going to be the Ted Koppel, who I know, and Larry King and a few other people. The headline's going to be, emergency doctor gets arrested for disclosing top secret document that confirms UFOs and that you guys killed Marilyn Monroe. You want that the headline? Come get me. And he looked at me, he said, you're crazy. I said, yeah, like a fox. I said, it's your worst nightmare. This is your worst nightmare. So that's the other part of disclosure. Don't be a lone wolf. Don't be a Bill Colby. Do it, come together with us, with a group of people, another five, 10, 20, 30 people deep inside the transnational security state, the deep state, and come forward. That's what I'm calling for people to do. So that's one thing we can do. The other is to each of us form our own CE5 groups. How many people here are part of a CE5 contact group somewhere? I'm just curious. Yeah, so a few of you. The rest of you need to do that. We have an app. If you go to seriousdisclosure.com and scroll down to the second bottom half of the page, there is actually an app to train you in the remote viewing and the contact protocols. And then there's another app, a free app, that will show you who is on CE5 teams in your area. And um, so you can register on that, put a, you know, create a new email just for contact in CE5 and start going out under the stars doing this because here's the power of mass consciousness. Dr. John at Princeton, the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab, found that if one person put their awareness on a random number generator, they could shift it, the zeros to ones or the ones to zeros just through their conscious effect. That's the power of the mind. 
Our minds have infinite power if we tap into that. If two people do it who love each other or are united, the effect was exponential, not arithmetic. It wasn't twice as much, it was 10 times as much. So when a group of people in higher consciousness go out for the purpose of making peaceful contact, understanding that our future is peace in the cosmos and where our destiny is to become extraterrestrials to other worlds eventually, where we will be interstellar. If you understand that, and understand, then if you begin to do that, don't worry about what phenomenon happens. The process of doing it itself is transformative and edifying. So please go and do that. That's another thing you can all do. Now I want to take a, the last few minutes to just take a few questions. We've got about 15 minutes. And anyone who has a question in the audience, if you can just yell it out and I'll repeat it so everyone can hear it. Yes, Simeon. Mm -hmm. Do you think such an organization like that and those types of events would help to resolve the issue of both hearing from either members of Congress or the president? Yeah, he's asking about the you know, um, you know, hearings in front of Congress and this sort of thing. Here's the problem with that. In reality, we've already done that. We've already given the full dossier to every member of Congress. I am not sanguine that any member of Congress is going to hold a hearing on this. Even Kucinich, who ran for president in 08, who had a sighting and a close encounter, he was outed by Shirley MacLaine, unfortunately, and I've known him for years. He became chairman of one of the subcommittees on government oversight, domestic. He wouldn't do it. Because the, the social opprobrium, condemnation, critical, ridicule is so great on this subject. It's more likely that more and more people defecting and doing us doing it through the new media and the internet um, would create a title. Now at some point, either a contact event will happen that cannot be suppressed or enough critical mass of people, a new wave of people defect where it just reaches critical mass. But for the president and the Congress to do it, they will only step in after we've done the very big heavy lift. So I think disclosure is in our hands, and in my opinion, in a sense, we've already done it. The majority of Americans believe we're not alone. 43% of Americans believe we're currently being visited by ETs. Um, Two-thirds of the public believes there's are intelligent life out there, and we've been historically visited. So in a sense, that, and I, when I started the project, that, the numbers were like 20, 25%. So in a sense, we've won that issue. It's, when people talk about disclosure, I say, well, in a sense, we've already done it. What hasn't happened is official disclosure. But the problem with official disclosure is that it's rare to find a politician who has the courage to make it their way through the condemnation, the ridicule, or the threats. And the threats are serious. And that's why we, we had such great hope that Clinton, and by the way, when Lawrence was hosting, when we were doing this briefing for President Clinton and Hillary at the Rockefeller Ranch, you know who stood up and stopped it? Hillary. She said, it's too dangerous. We don't want to hear anything more about it, and we're not going to pursue it. So President Clinton took the briefing, this huge thing I put together, and kept it in the private quarters of the White House in his bathroom, actually, to read. And he would occasionally bring it out. There was a person who used to live at the White House who's a friend of mine. And he says, yeah, he'd, he'd bring it out into the living room and he went through and he'd go, I know all this is true, but they won't tell me a thing, not a goddamn thing. That's what he said. So, you know, I, I just think that, you know, for, for the chief executive or the Congress to do it, we're going to have to create events of contact events. And it's harder in America than any other country because this country is the crown jewel. It's not that magic doesn't have subsidiaries globally, but this country is the crown jewel of the military, industrial, financial, laboratory, technology complex dealing with this. All other countries are an order of magnitude down in terms of what they have. And so for a president or a congressman to really go full bore at this, um, let's just say I'm not holding my breath. I, I'm calling for it. I think it'd be great if it happened. 
but I think we're going to have to do a lot more of the groundwork ourselves. The public, it has to be a mass public initiative, both making contact and bringing out more and more of these top secret witnesses before they will move off the dime. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I know a number. I've named a few. As some are recently deceased, some are still living. Like, you know, Cheney's certainly a member. Um, Papa Bush is a, is a member. Um, some of these royal families have representation, but minor. Um, all you have to do is look at the really top folks at the Lockheed Skunk Works, SAIC, Lockheed Martin. They're all involved. Um, you know, you have uh, David Rockefeller, used to be Chase Manhattan Bank. That, by the way, that's why Lawrence, who was his brother, who was sort of the philosopher king of the family, he wanted disclosure and peaceful contact. David, with the banking empire, was jumping up and down on his, well, I won't say what he told me, his toes, and was furious. If they're, a direct, if they're directly involved in the skunk works and the cube, yes, they would absolutely have knowledge. And there are people within the military and CIA. I know people at the CIA who are a member of this group. And what's interesting, when I first did the meetings with the CIA director, about a third of MAGIC supported the concept of ending the secrecy and bringing this out. I've been told that the number is now 70% are in favor. And I've met with a, a number of them. They're more the younger generation. The problem is the other 30% would drop them dead just like they killed Bill Colby. So you, it doesn't take them. It's not a democratic system. It's who's willing to be a murderer, you know, who, who's willing to kill who. So it's, and, and the other problem is that this group, Magic, has elements that are splintered off of the main policy board the main policy committee. So the folks who have gone off the reservation with electronic warfare systems, abductions, mutilations, those, all, those guys are in a paramilitary special operation, drug run, it's highly, and, and some of the people who are on the main, they don't actually have control over what those guys are doing. So people should get rid of the idea of some sort of top-down system. The architecture of the secrecy may have started that way, and much of it was under constitutional oversight with, with Truman and the early Eisenhower years, and then it went south. And, and it continues to go out of control, spinning out of control. Um, so that's what you need to understand. Yes, sir? I mean, can this group uh, conceive of themselves as, you know, people have talked about a breakaway civilization. I'm having a hard time getting my head around the end goal. Is it just ending warfare? Uh, is the objective of warfare? I mean, what is it? Okay, there are agendas within this group that are separate and competing, and sometimes they mesh. One would be macroeconomic global control. They want the oil system, the central utility system, and it's all a macroeconomic issue for those guys. Those would be more of the real politic folks like Papa Bush. Then you have the people who I mentioned are eschatologists. They would love to see a, a final battle happen that would result in the end of the world so that their Messiah or their Christ or whoever would return. I mean, they're religious nuts. I mean, they, they make the Taliban look like liberals. Then you have, well, really. Then you have um, an element that are sociopaths who really like endless war. They love torture. They like destruction. They're addicted to it. And I've met with some of these people. They are true psychopaths and uh, scary ca characters. Um, and then you have an agenda that has to do with um, the fact that they're not so much still attached to the secrecy, but they don't know how to come clean without it being the biggest scandal in the history of the United States and many other countries. Because imagine this information coming out and being confirmed. And the world learns that for 60 years we haven't needed oil or gas or coal that there have been all these things done. I mean, one of their concerns is that it could result in so much social instability they wouldn't be able to manage it. So there's a sort of inertia to the secrecy, a momentum, and it's very hard to stop it. So those are people who are just sitting on the fence who are placeholders, status quo holders. And a man that was uh, good friends with W, I met with him at the university club over here, and he was sort of his advisor on nuclear power and stuff like this. And, he said, you know, he says, I don't care if you're left, right, liberal, 
uh, conservative, Democrat, Republican, when you get into that building, and we just down the road, he was pointing at the White House, you govern as a conservative. I said, what do you mean? I said, he said, you do not want to be in charge when something this big happens and manage that change. I said, oh, I understand what you're talking about. I had an admiral who was in charge of CONUS, who was part of, and then another guy named Admiral Harry Train, who became a member of MAGIC. Um, you want names? I mean, I have a lot of names. And, he, and this guy said, well, CONUS is continental United States security. And he says, my job is to maintain the homeostasis and of the world energy supply, just to have nothing disrupted. That's why we're in the Middle East so heavily. He says, and what you're saying is true. This should never have been kept secret. It should come out. But I just want to retire from this command and go fishing at my ranch out in, I think it was Montana or Wyoming. He says, I just want to get out of this position. So, you know, you have to, you know, live in their shoes for a minute. And I have a lot of compassion for that. A lot of these people have inherited this mess that got started. And this is why Senator Goldwater said to me, he said, you know, it was a goddamn mistake then and it's a goddamn mistake now that this was ever kept secret. I'm quoting directly, I'm sitting in his living room. And, you know, so there are a lot of people who, though, who find themselves as placeholders and they just don't want to disrupt the status quo. So there are different agendas for the secrecy. Some is global domination macroeconomically. Some have this quasi-religious sort of end times, you know, final battle in space nonsense. You know, it's almost like you get into the wackiness of science fiction, but it's real, this Dr. Strange Lovian view. Some it's all just about maintaining the status quo of how the world operates. Because imagine if every village in Africa and every place in India had a free energy device, they had electrification, refrigeration, crops could be grown under controlled environments with zero energy cost. You would have the two and a half billion people in China and India, their economic output would, uh, would be parity with the United States. We only have 300 million. So the US and Europe only has 700 million, the rest of the world is seven billion. Money flows to where economic prowess and power is, right? That's why America is the biggest economy, China's about to get there, but, but bestrides the globe. But this would change the macroeconomic thing over, not almost overnight, certainly within a generation, 15 or 20 years. So those are folks who are looking at the reality of that kind of change and go, no, it's too big of a change. Now, that has been going on for 60 years or more. I mean, the secrecy on the energy stuff has been going on for 100. And that's what has led us to the precipice of an environmental meltdown and global injustice. And as more and more people are impoverished and a more and more elite parasitic kleptocracy has the money, this is a prescription for global revolution and upheaval and terrorism. So the more we stay on this path, the harder it's gonna be. So even though the change is daunting to take on, it's still the right thing to do. And the longer we put it off, the harder it's gonna be. So my advice has been for 20 years, meeting with people in high places, do it. But it's easier said than done. Uh, another question, yes ma'am. It's a great question, yeah. How do we help our children and our educational system and get them into this new paradigm? You have to do it yourself. Um, the system will take too long to catch up. It'll eventually get there. So when you start talking about the whole area of consciousness studies, high-tech sciences, you're not gonna be able to get that at MIT or in your public schools. But we as parents can provide that information to, to our children. The other thing is to encourage them to take risks. I mean, now we have bubble kids. You know, everyone's a bubble kid. I mean, I was raised, I was ran all over the city wild. Now, you know, you, my parents would have been in prison. We, we, don't, we don't let children take any risks. But you know what? We become so cowardly and timid that if our, if my parents' generation were like that, we'd all be goose-stepping to Adolf Hitler. So now there's an Adolf Hitler that's this sub rosa, Fourth Reich, 
and we have to have the courage to stand up to it. Now, there are costs to that. I've had a lot of, I've paid a very steep price. But I think ultimately, you don't have, you, you have to begin to embrace a bigger vision. So I'd say the first thing with our children is that it has to be a vision of being interested in something greater than themselves or their own aggrandizement or the next selfie. So it, it is a spiritual value where the concern is for the future of our planet, um, the helping of others, um, and doing things uh, even at great risk to yourself or ridicule and, and estrangement from your peers uh, that you're going to do it because it's the right thing to do. Now, that's a fundamental spiritual um, uh, foundation. And based on that, then you can take on the new energy issue or the contact or whatever it is. But so long as you're looking around and concerned what other people are thinking about you, which is how most people are. I'm sort of an outlier that way. I really don't care. From fourth grade, I decide I don't care what anyone thinks of me. Um, but I'm sort of an outlier that way. But I think that's really important, this sort of independent sense of investigating truth and willing to speak the truth and stay on your path, even if there's social condemnation, ridicule, whatever it is. Um, and that's moral character. To me, that's moral character. And that's one of the things that needs to be taught because just having the information about the technologies or contact isn't enough. There's this deeper uh, moral character that we need to inculcate in our children and in our culture. Um, and you know, I remember being chewed out by one of my ER doctor colleagues because I was late getting in one because a truck flipped over on the mountain. And I stopped because I'm an emergency doctor and the thing was about to burst into flames, a tanker truck, diesel fuel everywhere. And this guy was in there and he had a C4-5, he was numb from the nipples down. And, he was, and I pulled over and went in there and, pull, and, and got him out carefully so there wouldn't be any more damage, could have killed him, and before the thing blew up. And the guy chewed me out because I was 30 minutes late. I had the highway patrol call. And I said, well, what am I supposed to do? Just drive by and let this man die? He says, yes, because you're late. And this was a fundamentalist Christian. I said, well, you ever heard of the Good Samaritan? It was astonishing to me, this sort of self-absorbed, narcissistic. So I think we have to, I mean, don't get me started. I think we have to, you know, really teach our children and those around us by the force of example, basically. It's a dynamic force of example. That you're willing to do things that aren't always just to your own aggrandizement. Um, and that's important. I think it's really important by teaching by example. Yes, sir. There's compelling evidence that uh, not just in ours, but the entire World Trade Center complex uh, was uh, destroyed by perhaps a directed energy type of weapon, something that uh, hmm. is a operator of the technology of the molecular dissociation. Uh, that seems to be very much in place with what I was talking about. I have looked at it, you know, I have bigger fish to fry. 9-11 was terrible. Um, we lost 3,000 people. It led to two huge wars and trillions of dollars. Um, I will tell you this. I'm not gonna get into specifics. I mentioned a gentleman named Richard Foch, third highest guy, <clears throat> Richard Foch at the Naval Research Labs. He was in meetings with the then Vice President of the United States, Cheney. And he said, absolutely, it was known about in advance and there was involvement at that level. And he told me, and I have witnesses, multiple witnesses to this, that if he were to speak of this, now he's passed away, that he, his wife, his children, and his grandchildren would all be killed. That's all I'm gonna say on the 9-11 issue. But there is a lot to that story. I've never shared publicly what I just said, but the man has passed away. So it's not hard to, and I think most people get into these grand conspiracy theories. Basically, all you have to do is stand down. There's constant threat. There is terrorism out there. And you don't even have to hoax an event in that case. You just have to stand down the systems that would have intercepted it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So it's like when you're doing a code blue, boom, clear, 
you say clear before you do the electric shock. So you just clear the system, let it come in and hit. Now, what I think happened on 9-11 is more like the, what I just described. And I have very good reason to believe that because someone of that integrity and rank had a first had a front row seat uh, and knew about it. Um, and I've never spoken of this before or right now, but I, I think that it's, it's disturbing, um, it's enraging, but it's a minor rounding error compared to what's coming if we don't end this cartel's hegemony on the secrecy related to UFOs, ETs, what have you. 9-11 is gonna be a very minor blip on the screen. So uh, that's my warning to people. You can take it or not. Um, but I, well, no, I've known what you just asked about since it happened. Uh, my whole security team lit up like you wouldn't believe when that happened. Uh, yes, <clears throat> yes ma'am. <clears throat> They're all benevolent, by the way. You're right. Like, yeah. yeah, I would say any interstellar civilization has achieved a level of consciousness, even when they're fully in the physical form to be at that level of feeling. Those are the contact experiences I've had. Um, but I, I think that one thing that doesn't work is like when we go to Afghanistan and try to start Jeffersonian democracy amongst warlords that are living in the medieval time. These civilizations are not going to come here. Now, I think if things got very, very bad, there would be a massive intervention, honestly. But I think let's avoid that. Let's not just sit on our hands and let things collapse. Let's actually take the world where it is and turn it and put it on the path of our dreams. Let's dream a beautiful future and create that future. And if we do that, there's gonna be help in many dimensions, spiritual, extraterrestrial, and human that'll come into play. But we have to do it. And I really think those of us who have this information are the ones who are responsible for achieving it. We're out of time. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate you. God bless you all.